Every action you take is like a vote for the type of person that you wish to become. And it's at those moments when it's high, we can get ourselves to do hard things. A rule that I live by and a rule that I aggressively try to give anybody that will take it is... This is, I think, one of the common myths about behavior change. People say, um, oh, you know, behavior change is so hard. It's so difficult to change habits, whatever. The truth is we're changing all the time. Uh, one of the primary functions of your brain is to change your behavior whenever the environment shifts or whenever the context shifts. So you're very capable of change and you're kind of doing it constantly. However, in order to change in an intentional way, in order to be in control of that change and not just having it happen to you, I think you have to start with some kind of awareness. So the point that you just made about the book is actually about self-awareness. It's actually about understanding yourself better. It's actually about seeing some of the behaviors that you're usually blind to. Um, that I feel like is an essential first step if you want to be in control of that process in any way. A lot of people feel like they're the victim of their habits. But I think if you want to become the architect of them, you need to have some kind of self-awareness. You need to be able to identify what am I actually doing right now? What is the truth of the situation? And where do I want to go? What is the truth of what I want to become or want to achieve? And then you can start to bridge that gap once you have a better, uh, clearer understanding of where you currently stand and where you want to go. Is there an argument that we shouldn't use the term good and bad when it comes to habits? Now, I, I look, I get it. You know, most of us would consider, you know, I don't know, moving our bodies more, uh, you know, a, an inverted commas, good habits. But it, it you know, you, you, do, you describe so beautifully how all behaviors really are playing a role in our lives in some way. And in some ways, assigning good and bad to them might be, you know, layering on a level of judgment, which can often actually get people even more stuck. So I wonder if you can unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah, you can sort of twist this either way. Like on the one hand, you know, I do think there's an argument for just saying, listen, there aren't really good or bad habits. There are effective habits in the sense that they are effective at solving the problem that you're facing in that moment. And having some additional layer of judgment or feeling guilty about that probably isn't serving you. It's not really helping you move forward. So maybe we could dismiss that. On the other hand, I think we all sort of implicitly understand what yeah. we're saying when we say it's a good habit or a bad habit. But I have wrestled with this a little bit more because there are some academics or some researchers who kind of adamantly say uh, that there is no such thing as a good or a bad habit. And here's where I've come down on it. Um, pretty much all behaviors in life produce multiple outcomes across time. So broadly speaking, let's say there's an, an immediate outcome and there's an ultimate outcome. And with your bad habits or things that we commonly call a bad habit, usually the immediate outcome is favorable. Like the immediate outcome of eating a donut is great. It's sweet, it's sugary, it's tasty, it's enjoyable. It's only the ultimate outcome a year or two years from now, or if you keep eating donuts, that's unfavorable. Um, with a good habit or something we commonly call a good habit, like say going to the gym, um, the immediate outcome is often kind of unfavorable. Like the immediate outcome of going to the gym for the first week is your body looks the same in the mirror. The scale hasn't changed. If anything, you're a little bit sore. It's only the ultimate outcome, you know, a year or two or five later that is favorable. And I think, first of all, this is, I feel like this is an important point for a couple of reasons. First, it helps explain a little bit why we continue to repeat habits that we consider to be bad for us. The reason is because they serve you in the moment. You know, even something like smoking a cigarette, the immediate outcome might be that you get to socialize with friends outside the office or you curb your nicotine craving. It's only the ultimate outcome that is unfavorable. And um, we tend to have brains that are wired for immediate returns. And that, you know, that makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Like you would rather have a brain that takes shelter from a storm now uh, than one that doesn't. You would rather have a brain that prioritizes getting the next meal than giving equal weight to a meal that you might have in two weeks. Yeah. Um, and so it serves us usually to be immediately focused. But in modern society, it comes back to hurt us a little bit uh, when it comes to a lot of these bad habits. With good habits, however, um, it's a lot about finding ways to delay gratification 
um, or to pull the long-term rewards of those good habits into the present moment so you feel good right now. In you know, in, in ancient history or in prehistory, uh, our ancestors largely grew up in environments that were immediately focused, like I said, taking shelter from a storm or getting the next meal or something like that, um, avoiding predators. But modern society has become increasingly focused on delayed rewards. You go to school now so that you can graduate in a few years. You show up at work this week so that you can get a paycheck in a month. You save for retirement now so that you can have financial security a decade or two or three from now. And so modern society asks us to make more delayed return decisions than our ancestors did. And so I think we have a little bit of friction with a lot of the good habits that we want to build are more delayed than what maybe our biological underpinnings are wired for. So there's a little bit of a challenge there. Um, but I think the summary of this is that if I were to define what is a good habit, what is a bad habit, I would say the cost of your good habits are in the present, the cost of your bad habits are in the future. And it's really that gap between immediate outcome and ultimate outcome that I think helps define what is good or bad. Your good habits are the ones that serve you in the long run. Your bad habits are the ones that don't serve you well in the long run. And um, that I think is a, you know, maybe a simplistic way of viewing it, but it kind of gives us a clean division for how most of us actually use the word in conversation. Yeah, I really like that. And I think it just, I think the way you've come down there is it's really helpful because I think sometimes we can in science and academia sort of get a bit lost sometimes in terms of what technically is something, you know, how can we define it? And of course, I understand the value in that. But it also has to be translated for the layman in terms of, well, what does that mean for me? You know, and there's and value I, in being precise, but there's more value in being useful. And so I would rather be I would rather have a useful definition than a precise one. Um, and uh, this is maybe one example of that. Hey, you're preaching to the converts, and I, I'm all for things like that. It's about, you know, you know, you wrote a book, you you come up with these concepts, you write, I've got to say, I want to talk about your newsletter at some point. It's, it is just a brilliant newsletter. And it, guys, oh, if you, thank you. I would encourage anyone to sign up for it. Uh, the 3C1 newsletter. It's, it's one that I read on most weeks. I, I won't say I read it every week because I, I don't, but I, I see it every and I, I don't read them more I'm than... I'm just happy that you're showing up at all, man. I think it's great. Thank you. No, and I actually don't know how you produce that level of content on a weekly basis. Uh, you must have some... In fact, let's go there now. How You must have some pretty good habits or systems in place to produce such high quality output on a weekly basis. So I wonder if you're well, able to share some of them. Thank you for, for saying that. Um, you know, pretty much every thought we have is downstream from what we consume. And so I think the first step for me is trying to choose good pieces of information to consume. Um, almost all of my, like reading is kind of like fuel for me. The way that I think about it is um, I had this, this little challenge, this little uh, challenging point in my career where after about a year or two, my, my audience had started growing and I thought, oh, people are paying attention now. Now I need to be really good, you know? And so I thought, well, if I just spend more time writing, then that's how I can make it even better. I'd need to put more effort in. But actually, I think it ended up making it worse because what I didn't realize is that if I don't have good ideas to write about, I don't need to write more. I need to read more. And so it's kind of like driving a car and reading is like filling up the tank with gas uh, and writing is like going on an adventure and going on a journey and getting somewhere. And the point of having a car is not to just stay at the gas station and fill it up with gas all day. Like you're supposed to actually go somewhere. So if you only consume, that's not beneficial. But if all you do is try to drive and put stuff out, um, then at some point you run out of gas. And so I need a balance between the two. Um, I get that in a couple different ways. Uh, trying to select good books to read, of course, is you know a big part of that. But I've found Twitter to be really useful. I've spent what probably would be considered an unreasonable amount of time uh, curating my Twitter feed. And like I would say, it might be over 100 hours at this point that I've spent looking at different profiles. Should I follow this person or not? What about people I really like? Who do they follow? And like just kind of doing this endlessly, you know, over and over again. I sort of do this kind of, it's like bulking and then cutting basically, but for Twitter. So I kind of like bulk up and add the 100 accounts that I'm going to follow. And then I sit with that for a couple of weeks and then I cut again and, you know, only keep the ones that are really useful, really high signal, low noise. 
But the end result of that is that essentially I'm crafting my information flow because I log in there, you know, for an hour or two every day. And that's determining what I'm seeing in my timeline, what's popping up in my feed. And I would say at this point, every day, I probably get at least three ideas from my Twitter feed, probably more uh, that I take notes on and maybe spark me to go read something more, go down a rabbit hole or something like that. So I really feel like that's probably the most important part in my process is crafting information flows and figuring out what to read. And then the ideas sort of come bubble up naturally uh, when you're getting that much inspiration. Um, I have more practical or tactical stuff. Like we have a big spreadsheet that I keep where I dump all of my ideas into it and I dump any interesting quotes I have into it. And eventually those, you know, we go back through those and I select my favorites and those kind of make it into the newsletter. So there's sort of like an additional round of curation that goes on. But, uh, but I do think reading is probably the most important part of the process. Yeah, what, what's interesting about that for me, James, is we started off this conversation talking about our social environments. And we, we, we're quite, lit, we sort of, we've kind of evolved it into your social media environments, which, which certainly is part of our social environment. The way humans now live and consume information and interact with people is done online. It, it, you know, a lot of it's done online, a lot of it's done through social media. And I really like that idea. I, I've been sort of talking on my Instagram, uh, as, as it happens, about this for a while to people say, look, you, you've really got to take control over who you're following, you know, the way you're going to think, the way, your ideas of the world, but also how you feel. Like if you're struggling with stress and anxiety, I sort of think, well, if you are you following people who make you feel more stressed, make you feel more anxious, whose whole persona is on calling other people out and then therefore it's going to be a whole divisive um, type of feed you're following? Or are you, or do you want to spend time following, you know, people who make you feel good, positive, um, you know, compassionate, you know, what, whatever it is you want. It's not for me to say what people should or shouldn't follow. I guess you found what you need from Twitter and you've not just left it up to chance, which kind of goes to your central theme in the book as well, which is about, you know, we're results of the habits we're following. But half the time, we don't even know that these are habits that we've been actually following until we shine a light on it. And it's the same principle that you're using with Twitter, right? You're, you're being really intentional about who you're following. But would you recommend, given, given how important our environment and what we surround ourselves with is, would you almost say that that is something that all of us should be considering when we go online? Oh, I, I think so. You, when you choose the people that you follow online, you are sort of like, it's like you get to pick the citizens for your own little city. You know, you're getting to create that. And you want to be very careful about who you let into your city, about who you're, you're allowing to be part of that information flow. Because essentially what you're choosing is you're choosing the people who are shaping your thoughts. And that's one of the most important choices that you can make. So I agree with you. I think a lot of the time behavior on social media is somewhat mindless. We just, well, we follow someone because we've been following them for a long time. And we, you know, look at their posts because we always look at the posts when we log into Instagram or Twitter or wherever. And we don't really think carefully, does this actually benefit me? Like, does this, is this giving me good things to think about? Do I feel better about myself after I look at this? I had one friend who she told me, she was like, I just deleted Instagram because I felt worse about myself after I logged in every time. And it took her a while to realize that. Uh, and I don't think that's necessary. I mean, I have an Instagram account. But I do think that you need to be careful about who you follow. Um, so curating that is a, a big part of, yeah, you're not only choosing who to follow, you're choosing what your future self will think. And um, you want to make sure that you're giving yourself the opportunity to have good future thoughts. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen The Social Dilemma that's come out recently on Netflix. Um, I haven't seen it, but I know Tristan and have been familiar with his work for a little while. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I certainly think it's one of the most important documentaries I've seen in a long time. It definitely warranted me plugging in, uh, waiting for the box to load for five minutes before I could press play on that. But it, it really has made me think and... You know, we've not spoken about identity yet, and I really want to. I really want to get into that. But what was interesting about the social media algorithms and the way they were explaining it in the documentary is that actually, they're actually changing the way that we think, and therefore changing the way that we behave. And if if we really take that 
put that at the forefront of our minds, if the people you follow and the algorithms, which are then tracking that and then feeding you more content, have the potential to change how you think and then how you behave, well, what could be more important than curating your online world intentionally? One thing I was doing before, I think it makes a difference. So on Instagram, when you follow someone, you can actually go in and actually um, add them to a close friends list. And I, that's what I started doing. Maybe there's 10 or 20 people. They're not all close friends, but I've added them to close friends list because I'm like, I really like these people's content. I actually want to see their content when they post it. And that's, that's that, again, it's just another practical thing that I think it helps people take control a little bit. Yeah, I would agree. It's uh, choosing information flows, social media being probably one of the primary ones for all of us is uh, a huge crucial thing for kind of shaping your future thoughts. But Jason, but you've got these four laws, these these four laws of change, of, of behavior change, I guess. And I wonder if we could go through them. I guess we've touched on a couple of them in sort of passing so far. But before we start that, I wonder if you could define what a habit is, what an atomic habit is, and then we can maybe sort of expand upon these four laws. So there are a couple different definitions of a habit. You know, the one that's most common or is something to the effect of a habit is a behavior that you've repeated enough times to be more or less automatic or, you know, it's something a fairly mindless, automatic routine behavior. So brushing your teeth, tying your shoes, unplugging the toaster after each use, like you just kind of do these things automatically. They take 30 seconds or a minute or, you know, they're pretty quick. Um there are some other ways to define a habit, though, and I like to use some of these alternate definitions because I think it helps reveal a little bit more nuance about what habits are and where they live in our lives. So, for example, another way to define a habit is it's a behavior that is repeated in a particular context. So you start to realize that the environment matters a lot in habits, like your couch at 7 p.m. might be where you watch Netflix. Um, and so it's actually the behavior of watching Netflix is tied to that context. If you're somewhere else at 7 p.m., then you probably won't perform that same habit. And so you start to realize how much your behavior is linked to the environment or the circumstance around you. Uh, a third definition of a habit, which I really like, um, Jason Rea, who's a behavioral scientist, he has something where he says something to the effect of habits are solutions to recurring problems in your environment. And what I like about that is it speaks to habits serve a purpose. They are effective at solving some kind of problem. And if you start to unpack that a little bit more, you see that there can be quite a variety in the habits that people build. For example, you finish the work day and it's like 6 p.m. and you're exhausted and tired from a long day of work. Well, in a sense, that's a problem that your brain needs to solve. And one person might solve that problem by playing video games for an hour. And another person might solve it by smoking a cigarette. And a third person might solve it by going for a run. And you can see pretty quickly that there are some solutions that are more effective or optimal or healthy than others. And I think the question to ask yourself, you know, early on when you're a child, you inherit these solutions, you kind of inherit, you soak up the habits that you see role model by your parents or your friends or whatever experiences that you happen to have in your narrow sliver of the universe. But what are the odds that the habits that you inherited from your childhood, the experiences you had and the things that you saw done are also the optimal solution to the, the problems that you face. Yeah. It's very unlikely that whatever you happen to stumble across is actually the optimal way to do it. And if you realize that, then you come to discover that as you become an adult and you're more in control of your habits and your environment, it becomes your responsibility to assess what are the problems and challenges I face repeatedly, the things that I'm trying to solve, and what would be a better way to do that? What are the optimal solutions? So it's not your fault if you inherited uh, unhelpful habits or unproductive habits, but it is your responsibility to try to figure out how to adjust those and how to improve those in some meaningful way. Yeah. All right, so that's kind of a, my long definition of what is a habit. Um, now, what is an atomic habit? I use the phrase atomic because I, I think it has three meanings and all three kind of apply to building better habits. So the first meaning of the word atomic is tiny or small, like an atom. And that is part of my philosophy. Habits should be small and easy to do and not very difficult and convenient. 
The second meaning of the word atomic is the fundamental unit in a larger system. So atoms build into molecules, molecules build into compounds, and so on. And we mentioned this earlier, but your habits are kind of like the fundamental unit of the overall system that you run. Each one's like a little gear in the overall machine. And collectively, you put all those little units together and you end up with your daily routine or your lifestyle. And then the third and final meaning of the word atomic is the source of immense energy or power. And I think that if you combine all three of those meanings, you make changes that are small and easy to do, and you layer them together like units in a larger system, you can end up with some really powerful results. And those three kind of different meanings of atomic, I think if you apply those to building better habits, you can end up with a really powerful system of better habits and behaviors. And so that's kind of where the phrase atomic habit came from and how I feel uh, or think about using it uh, in that context. Yeah. Wow. No, thanks for that. Really, yeah, really useful way to think about habits. So trying to think about habits through the lens of health, let's say, meditation is a habit I should say, meditation is a practice that many people struggle to do consistently. Many people have the the desired outcome of, I want to meditate. I want to be a meditator. I read about all these benefits, but I just can't do it. And I wonder if it might be useful to try and unpick why it's difficult, but through the lens of those four laws. I wonder if you'd be game for that to see if we can maybe, to make it super practical for people. Yeah, sure. Of course. Let me just give a summary of the four laws first, and then we can uh, kind of dive into using that example. So if you want to have it stick, you kind of roughly have four different things that if you can get them working for you, uh, they're sort of like levers. And if they're in the right positions, building good habits is easier. And if they're in the wrong positions, you're kind of fighting an uphill battle. So uh, the first thing is you want to make your habits obvious. Um, Most habits are preceded by some kind of cue. And so you want the cues of your habits to be obvious, available, visible, easy to see. The easier it is to see or get your attention, the more likely you are to stick with the habit or perform it. The second one is to make your habits attractive. Um, If you want your habits to be motivating, if you want them to be compelling, uh, then you need it to be attractive in some form. The third law is to make it easy. So the easier, more convenient, frictionless your habits are, uh, the more likely likely you are to perform them. We've talked a little bit about that with environment design already. Um, And uh, the fourth and final thing is you want to make it satisfying. So the more satisfying or enjoyable a habit is, the more likely you are to stick with it. Now, not every behavior in life is satisfying or rewarding, right? Sometimes things have a cost or a consequence. Sometimes they're fairly neutral. But if a behavior is not rewarding, if it's not enjoyable, at least to some degree, then it's unlikely to become a habit. It needs to have some kind of positive emotional signal associated with it that kind of tells your brain, hey, that felt good. You should repeat this again next time. So just so real quick summary, the four laws of behavior change, make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. And I think that sort of gives you a high level framework for getting a good habit to stick. I'll just kind of make a note of this right here. We don't have to get into it in detail, but I do just want to mention it, which is those four help you build a good habit. If you want to break a bad habit, then you just invert those four. So rather than making it obvious, you want to make it invisible, unsubscribe from emails, or reduce exposure to the queue. Um, rather than making it attractive, you want to make it unattractive, uh, making it easy, make it difficult, increase friction, add steps. Rather than making it satisfying, make it unsatisfying, add some kind of immediate cost or consequence to the behavior. So that's like the high level view for breaking a bad habit. Uh, And obviously, the book goes into many more examples of like how to do each of those. But um, we can talk about the how to apply it to to meditation now. Yeah. So someone's listening to this or watching it on YouTube, and they go, right, okay, I'm bought in, going to get James's book, I'm going to start a meditation practice. Where should I begin? Um, How would you advise them using your sort of framework of these laws? So usually if I if I say, okay, we got to start in some place, what's the first thing I should do? I actually typically recommend what I call the two minute rule. And the two minute rule is part of that third law, which is making it easy. Um, And the two minute rule says take whatever habit you're trying to build and scale it down to something that takes two minutes or less to do. So do yoga four days a week becomes take out my yoga mat or meditate for, you know, 15 minutes a day becomes meditate for two minutes. Um, 
And sometimes I say that and people resist it a little bit because they're like, okay, you know, I know the real goal isn't just to take my yoga mat out, right? And I know I'm actually trying to do the workout. So this is some kind of mental trick. And like, <laughs> why would I fall for it, basically? And I get where people are coming from. But so I have this reader, his name's Mitch, and uh, he lost a bunch of weight, he's kept it off for over a decade. But for the first um, six weeks that he went to the gym, he had a rule for himself where he wasn't allowed to stay for longer than five minutes. So he'd get in the car, drive to the gym, get out, do half an exercise, get back in the car, drive home. And it sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds silly. You're like, obviously, this is not going to get the guy the results that he wants. But if you take a step back, what you realize is that he was mastering the art of showing up, right? He was becoming the type of person that went to the gym four days a week, even if it was only for five minutes. And I think this is a much deeper truth about habits that often gets overlooked, which is a habit must be established before it can be improved, right? It has to become the standard in your life before you can optimize and scale it up. And for whatever reason, we get very all or nothing with our habits. You know, it's like I have to find the perfect workout program or the ideal business plan or the best diet to follow before I can take a first step. And I can imagine in this um, meditation example, there are probably many people who are like, well, what is the best form of meditation? Like that would be one of the first first things they would ask themselves. Then they'd spend hours researching on YouTube and whatever. And, you know, a lot of the time we put off action because we think I need to learn more. But usually the best way to learn is by taking action. And so the two minute rule kind of helps you overcome that tendency to have this like perfectionist spiral and research too much and encourages encourages you to just get started. So I think that's step number one is let's take meditation and let's just scale it down to something you can always do. We're just going to meditate for say 60 seconds. Um, and then we can start to apply some of the other laws. So let's say we've got the first law, make it obvious. Well, uh, there are a couple of different things that you could make meditation obvious. You could, if you're going to do it on your phone, if you're going to download one of the meditation apps like Calm or Waking Up or Headspace or something like that, you could take that app and put it on the home screen, the way that I mentioned earlier in this interview about moving Audible there. So you can make it the most obvious app on your phone. If you don't care about that, or you're just going to do it like in your house or in a room or something, um, you need to figure out where is that going to occur. So this is one of this is something I mentioned in the book, I think it's in chapter five, I talk about implementation intentions. And yeah. implementation intentions are when you state your intention to implement a particular behavior at a certain time in a certain place on a certain day. So it's like, when do I meditate? I meditate on Mondays at 7am in my guest room or whatever, you know, like you just you have to have a space where that actually happens. And um, maybe you have a meditation pillow. So you set that up. And that's all you know, the environment, the space is primed, you know, it could be just in the corner of your living room or something. But there needs to be some space where that habit lives. Um, and it's very clear when and where to do it. A lot of people feel like what they lack is motivation, but what they really lack is clarity. Um, they lack a very clear understanding of when and where the habit's going to live. So honestly, I think just those two things. So that's the first law, make it obvious, deciding when and where it's going to occur. And the, and the third law, make it easy, um, scaling it down and just doing it for 60 seconds or two minutes or whatever. Those two things alone would go a long way in getting people to, to stick with a new meditation habit. Yeah, that, that's really, really helpful, James. And I just want to share with you a patient story from, I'm going to guess, seven, eight years ago. And, you know, I, I've often said this, but as a medical doctor, I mean, I can definitely put my hands up and, and say very clearly that my patients have taught me a lot more than I've taught them. Because I often say this when I'm teaching doctors as well, really listen to your patients, listen to what they're telling you. They will often tell you why something's working, why it's not working. And one thing I've observed, I'd be really curious as to why does the same advice work for one patient and not work for another patient? Why does one patient go with that and sort of implement it all and come back like a different person, literally a different person, not just different health, a different person, uh, which we'll also talk about, um, and why, why does someone else really, really struggle? I remember this case, uh, this lady who I think stress and, and chronic unremitting stress was driving a lot of her symptoms, her headaches, her insomnia, her mood issues. 
and we tried all kinds of things. And she actually wanted to meditate, but she said, she tried before, but when I sort of probed her a little bit, she said, ah, oh, it's just not for me, Doc. I've tried it, I've tried the apps. You know, I've tried YouTube videos, it's just not for me. And when you, when you probed, when I, when I sort of delved a bit deeper, she'd actually made it really hard. She wanted to do 20 minutes consistently. And because she hadn't met that bar, she in her head is not a meditator. So, so I said to her, I said, hey, look, what do you think you could commit to every day? Could, could you do 10 minutes? She goes, no, no. I, I could try, but I don't think so. I said, okay, how, how about five? She thought about it. She said, I don't know. I said, okay, okay, how about one minute? She said, well, yeah, I could do one minute, but will it make any difference? I said, well, hold on a minute. Let's just make a commitment here, right? So I, and actually, you know, it's a lot of, uh, a lot younger as adults about then. And I said to her, I tell you what, whatever you commit to doing, I will also do it. I write it in a diary. And when you, when, when you come back to see me next week, we'll compare, right? So I added that sort of accountability piece with her, but she started off doing one minute. And we, we also defined when she was going to do it. It was going to be first thing in the morning before she did anything else. That one minute, you know, after a couple of weeks became five minutes, not because I asked her to, but because she, as you would say, she was mastering the art of showing up. You know, I didn't know how to articulate it. I didn't know the science of behavior change back then. I was sort of just going on intuition as a clinician. How can I help that lady do what she tells me she wants to do? And now she's meditating for 20 minutes a day, locked in, right? And it's, so if anyone is skeptical about your two minute rule, I would sort of concur as a clinician that this stuff works, you know, you just got to commit to it, right? You know, one of the most motivating feelings for the human mind is the feeling of progress. Yeah. If you're making progress, you have every reason in the world to continue. You know, it's like, oh, we're moving forward. I'm, you know, I'm making progress on the goal that I'm hoping to achieve. And so there's this weird trick that we can play on ourselves in our brain where we're like, well, I want to meditate for 20 minutes. And if she would have done it for one minute, she would have felt like a failure if that was her expectation, right? But somehow just by shifting it and saying, no, I'm only going to try to do this for one minute. If she does it for two minutes, she feels like she crushed it, you know? And so this, it's this very strange thing. And I, I think um, that's a good argument for, especially in the beginning, starting with keeping the bar low and you need to get in your reps. And this is true, I think, for almost any kind of habit that you're building. Like you need the repetitions, whether it's meditating for one minute or writing one sentence or reading one page. It doesn't matter that it's it's almost always better to do less than you had hoped than to do nothing at all. And um, the two minute rule kind of helps nudge you toward that direction, nudge you toward the direction of getting in your reps, uh, getting it done and mastering the art of showing up, even if it's in a small way, and then using that as a foothold to advance to the next level and kind of build some momentum and get that feeling of progress. Yeah. Now, now you, you sort of frame that with two of the four laws. I really like the fourth law, uh, make it satisfying. What are some of the ways that people can make things satisfying? As you were talking about before, how can you, often the problem is with good habits or, you know, in adverted commas, good habits, the problem often is, is the, the, the desired effect is somewhere in the future. Right. So, how, so how, can, how can people bring that into the present? Well, I think the ultimate form of a reward is feeling like you're showing up as the type of person that you want to be, that it's reinforcing your desired identity. But as you mentioned, the problem is it takes a long time for that to be true. Like the first time you meditate, you don't identify as I'm a meditator and it feels good to do this because that's part of who I am and part of my identity. It might take you a year or two or who knows how long before you actually start to adopt that feeling. I mean, I didn't identify as an author until I actually had a published book. Like even when I was writing it, I didn't feel like I was an author. So that that can take a long time. Um, I think the key, though, is that in my opinion, there are kind of two things. One, you want some kind of a reward that is immediate. And I think the speed of it is actually quite important. You need to feel that positive emotional signal right away so that you have a, a reason to tie that behavior to feeling good, and you have a reason to repeat it again in the future when the same situation arises. So there are a couple different ways you can do this. Um, you know, one very simple way that applies to almost any habit is to use a habit tracker. So yeah. um, I'd like to use my dad as an example here. So both of my parents like to swim. 
But one of the challenges with swimming is that your body looks exactly the same when you get out of the water as it does when you jumped in. And so you have no evidence that that workout was worth it, right? You have no evidence that this is actually getting you what you want. And so what my dad does is after each workout, he pulls out a little calendar and he puts an X on that day. And it's a small thing, but that X in the moment is something that matches the frequency of the habit. Every time he swims, he also gets to put an X down. And it gives him a signal of visual progress. We just mentioned that progress is one of the most motivating feelings for the human mind. You need to have some way to visualize that, some way to see that you're progressing. Because if you can't see the change in your body, or there's no change on the scale yet, you need something else that says, hey, that was the right thing to do. This feels good to show up and do the thing I want to do. So uh, a habit tracker is one very simple one. The other thing, though, and people talk about external rewards all the time. Um, And so, you know, like, oh, I went to the gym. And so I'm going to reward myself by getting an ice cream cone or something. But uh, my little nuance or argument here is I think you want to choose external rewards that align with the internal identity that you're trying to build. So if you reward yourself for going to the gym by getting an ice cream cone, that's kind of like casting votes for two different identities. Like on the one hand, you're casting a vote for being a healthy person. On the other hand, you're casting a vote for eating ice cream or whatever. So instead, you could do something like reward yourself, you know, any week when you don't miss a workout, you reward yourself with a bubble bath at the end of the week. And that's sort of like uh, an external reward that also is a vote for taking care of your body. And so that kind of aligns with that identity that you're trying to build through working out. Or say um, any month that you uh, hit your target of saving for retirement, you some people might say, oh, well, you could reward yourself by buying a leather jacket, but that doesn't really align with the financial saving mentality you're trying to build. So instead, I would say, well, any month that you hit that target, you could reward yourself with, say, uh, a free hour where you get to take a walk in the park or free time to do whatever you want. Because really what you're trying to get to with retirement is freedom. And so you're kind of aligning with that same internal identity that you're trying to build. But I do think that the faster, so the immediacy part, the faster you can get a positive reward, that's a really powerful thing. And the more that your external rewards can align with the internal identity you're trying to build, that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. Fixed mindset is where you believe your talent and intelligence are fixed. You're just born with it, is the way it is. Growth mindset is your talent and your intelligence can be changed through deliberate practice. So I was headed down one path where I thought, "Ah, this is, I was just born with this, whatever this is. And my life was about putting myself in situations where I felt cool and smart and didn't believe I could get any cooler or smarter. And then when I finally realized, oh wait, that's actually a dumb way to frame the world, click binary switch over to, I choose to believe that I'm malleable, that I can get better, that I can get smarter, that I can learn something today that I didn't know how to do yesterday. And I went from, I mean, just to make this really gross for a second, I learned all of that in a dingy one bedroom apartment in a bad neighborhood with no furniture because I couldn't afford any. And we're now recording the podcast in my gigantic Beverly Hills mansion, right? And I'm saying that is a result of the mindset. That is not a result of me being better than somebody at something. That is a result of me figuring something out that I think not everybody can do, but anybody listening to this podcast, if they've made it this far, they meet what I call minimum requirements. Wait, that is an empowering story. What I'm getting from you, Tom, is... This idea that change is available to us at any time. Correct. And, you know, we we explore this a little bit on on my conversation on on your show about what does it take for us to change? Do we need adversity of a certain intensity to, you know, to ask ourselves to challenge our own belief system and you know, make us change basically. And I guess this is this something I know you wrestle with. I wrestle with this all the time. I lie in bed thinking about this stuff. Thinking, do you need fundamentally pain on one level to actually start the process of change? I don't think necessarily you do, but I think a lot of us, unfortunately, that is what ends up happening. That certainly is for me. What was it for you? How did you go from changing from a fixed to a growth mindset? Because I've heard people say, you know, you've either got one or the other. You've either got your fixed uh, mindset or you've got a growth mindset. And this fascinates me on an individual level. This fascinates me for patients that I see. Frankly, this fascinates me for my children, right? Two young kids under 10. 
I want to learn from you about these different mindsets. If we are malleable, if we can adapt, if change is always available to us, then what are those things that we should be doing? So here's the bad news about my story. It, of course, involves pain. So I didn't have to hit some crazy rock bottom, so I'm very grateful for that. So mine was a mixture of deep personal shame, of feeling like I was talking a big game about being successful, but I was not doing anything to actually become successful. And my father-in-law certainly was lovingly calling me out on that. Um, and made it clear that he didn't want me to marry his daughter because he didn't see me doing anything with my life. And his very pointed question was, how do you plan to take care of my daughter? And uh, my response to him was, I know what you see is a broke, out of work, undereducated kid, but I'm the most ambitious person you've ever met. And then the next day I laid in bed probably for four hours in the morning and had done that the day before and the day before and the day before and the day after and the day after and the day after. And, the day after. and it wasn't until finally I was like, man, I'm telling my wife I'm gonna, or my then fiance, I'm gonna make her rich one day and I'm not doing anything to actually make good on that. And I've been saying this stuff for a very long time. I had been telling people I was gonna be rich probably since I was 11 or 12. And so, I just thought, wow, I say this all the time, but I'm not doing anything. And the fact that my wife, then fiance, is having to guilt me just to get out of bed, like that's a bad sign. So that begins a process. There was nothing binary, unfortunately. It wasn't like some lightning rod moment where one day I have a fixed mindset, then I have a growth mindset. Like I'm, I'd started researching the brain by this point. And so I'm thinking like, yeah, man, like it is a little weird that I'm not doing anything. Like, what do I know about the brain that would sort of explain this? And then as I begin learning about the brain and start coming across some of these ideas about brain plasticity and how much we can change. And I start really buying into that. Then I meet people that have, they wouldn't have called it a growth mindset. We didn't have that language back then but they had a growth mindset and they believed that they could change. And so I was like, whoa, yeah, this thing that I believe, I'm actually seeing it here in reality. And so right then I got involved in being an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur is like, if you want a growth mindset, put your house on, a line, on the line and start a business. You'll get a growth mindset real fast because it's either that or you're gonna lose the business because you just have to own. I'm not good enough yet. I do not understand this. I'm too dumb to pull this off. So I really better get smart fast. So are many of us too comfortable then to develop a growth mindset? So if our lives are okay, if we have a roof over our head, if we can pay the bills and you know we're not, let's say, deeply fulfilled, but we're just going around living our life. We're waiting for the weekends. We get smashed on a Friday night, a Saturday night to sort of, you know, for, for a whole multitude of reasons, um, you know, you, you are making the case, I think, that you can just choose. It's yeah, I, I don't want to make it sound too easy because it it is not. And the brutally difficult, it's deadly simple, but it is very difficult for most people. So the problem is far more insidious than, oh, it's just people are too comfortable because you have billionaires killing themselves. So we're dealing with now a mental health crisis. And so to really unpack the answer of change, you can't, you can talk about it without talking about the microbiome, but it would be a mistake. And so getting to really understand your physiology, I hope is one of the things that I beat the drum so hard that people really begin to research the brain. They begin to research um, mood disorders. They understand exercise. They understand diet because what ends up happening is your mood is so dysregulated. Your belief system is so dysfunctional and the psychological immune system is so strong that you get that biofilm around your belief system that becomes impenetrable. And no matter what you say to people, no matter what example you show to them, they just cannot shake themselves out of dysfunction. So what's happening is people have, they have created an identity without realizing that they've created an identity. So when you, if you're going to recognize that your identity in and of itself is a construction and then ask yourself, okay, well, what would be the ideal identity to construct? The answer is to be that of the learner. If you have a fixed mindset and your identity is something that is anything other than being a learner, it 
it is very fragile. So to use Nassim Taleb's language, you need to build an identity that is anti-fragile because if you don't, when someone attacks you, what happens? You feel badly about yourself, right? It's very easy to get under somebody's skin because you've triggered their insecurities. When you trigger their insecurities, the psychological immune system kicks in and it says, no, 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 Ron again, you're not bad. They're bad. They're dumb. They don't know what they're talking about. They're an idiot. Only a fool would not be keto or not be a vegan or whatever their identity is wrapped around. And so they go on the offensive and they never stop to think, hey, when like I'll give everyone listening, lean in. I want you to hear this part. When somebody tries to hurt you, they will almost always start with something real. So they're going to come at you with the thing that they know you're most insecure about. And so why do people, when somebody, um, people are always like, oh, if they come after you for your looks, it's because they've lost. No, they, they're coming after you for something they know will hurt you. So people are coming after you at a place where they are most likely to trigger you. The triggering is the psychological immune system, which is beneficial because people with the highest levels of self-delusion also report the highest levels of happiness. So that's incredible, right? That's super powerful. I'm so grateful for the psychological immune system. I can only imagine the number of times it saved me from spiraling into despair because I see myself a little too accurately. So I get its use. But if you flip your mentality and say, my identity is not as a entrepreneur, it's not as a vegan, it's not as a doctor or a podcaster, my identity is that of the learner. That's it. The only thing that I value myself for is my willingness to admit when I'm wrong and to learn. Now, the, the secret power there is one, it's anti-fragile. So the more you attack somebody for being stupid, if they're a learner, I, I am literally asking one question when somebody says I'm doing something wrong or I'm dumb. What am I doing wrong? In what way am I dumb? Because if you give me that piece of information, I grow more powerful. So I'm always looking at the hilarious secret about wanting people to criticize you is like, the more you try to hurt me with something real, I have the chills. The more you try to hurt me with something real, the more powerful I'm going to grow because I'm actually going to open myself up. Even though you're, you're saying it to hurt me, you are actively trying to tear me down. You're probably going to hit me with something that I can learn from. And so what I always tell people is when people are chucking rocks at your head, think of them as actually being gold nuggets or bricks or whatever. And you can take that gold to the bank. You can take that brick and build a house, like however you want to think of it, but you have to let it hit you. You can't deflect it and send it flying off in another direction. You've got to take it. It's going to sting a little, but then you're going to have that material with which you can do something. And so if you build your identity around being the learner and you're constantly growing, over time you grow more powerful, but you have to lower the psychological immune system or you can tweak it. Much like you can go in and edit a virus to deploy something in the human body, you can edit the psychological immune system to say the only thing you can protect me with is that I'm the learner. Love it. I, mean, I love that. I love this idea of being anti-fragile. Mm. What a that's gonna seem to love for you. Yeah, what a beautiful concept. What a powerful idea, particularly these days, right? Where we're all getting offended at every little thing. We can't put anything out without getting offended by someone. But mm. what does that tell you? You know, as we discussed, Tom, I mean, I love these days I'm in a really good place where I feel I can any any friction in my life, anything that starts to bother me. For me, that's an opportunity to learn. That's something. Why is that bothering me? Why is that triggering me? Is there an element of truth behind this? Or do I disagree? I don't think I'm as anti-fragile as I would like to be. In fact, I know I'm not because I'm, you know, I'm constantly trying to grow at this stuff. But it is even just that flipping mindset whereby instead of looking at who's posted the comments and looking them up and thinking, what do <laughs> they know? Right? That sort of thing. It's like, hold on a minute, is there an element of truth to this? Mm. Why is this triggering me? And I think that then comes back to this idea that you said, when we realize that these ideas that we have constructed are simply, they're just constructs we put in our mind, right? But if you have not realized that, that, that is what you said, you've not realized. Mm. So how do you help people? Is it possible to help people who have not yet realized or who, who don't accept that what is in their mind is a construct that accept this is the way I am. This is my personality. I cannot change that. So here's the very 
distressing and painful realization I've come to. It's probably possible. It does not violate the laws of physics. So there is some like magical answer that you get to. And as a doctor, you well know, it's going to be different for every person. So now it, it doesn't scale. And since I'm obsessed with scale, I just had to let go. If somebody's not already there, if they're not willing to go, okay, I buy that premise and now I just need like the different paths and the ways that I go about this, but like the central premise I buy, um, I just don't put energy there. I actually find that very distressing. And my initial inclination, because a lot of this of course is born from there are people that I love that don't have a growth mindset. And so it started with, oh, I just want to help that person. And then you realize, wow, man, I've been at this for decades and I've made no progress. So this is certainly a function of me. I'm not good enough to make that breakthrough. So I can keep going and try to optimize my everything for that one person. Or I can say, you know what? When, they're, when, when they have sort of terraformed their own mind to the point where they're receptive to this, I will be here. Um, but until then, I'm going to go over here and just say, all right, look, here's a, a base assumption that I have. If you agree with that and you want to understand like where I'm coming from and how to use these tools and tactics, like then I'm here. But otherwise, there's a guy named Jeffrey Canada who introduced me to this concept. And I really want to get him on my show because I think I'm quoting him accurately, but I responded so strongly. And I probably encountered this idea almost 15 years ago now. And he um, grew up in Harlem and said, I'm going to go get a degree and I'm going to change the education system. And he ends up getting a full ride, I think, to Harvard and goes back into the school system and realizes, well, you can't change it and gets very influential in starting up his own education system and realizes that you can't save the adults. And so he said, you have to give up on the adults and focus on women who are pregnant or may become pregnant. And all you need to do is get them to read to their children because it's the number of positive words people hear by the age of five that like he considered the single most predictive thing of their future success, which is exactly why he said your zip code is so predictive of your future success because it basically says how many words, positive words you're going to hear by the age of five. And I was like, fuck, that's crazy. But when you think about the language centers of your brain and like what that impacts in terms of future ability to communicate and get a good job and oh man, it's just crazy. So anyway, that whole concept of give up on adults, focus on kids, gave me the language to understand, give up on people for whom it would, it's not that it's an impossible task. It's that it is so hard. It doesn't scale, go where it's easy. And if you're talking about education, easy is young. And so when I think about mindset, I, the easy is people who already embrace the notion of a growth mindset. They may not have built one yet, but they believe in it. So how do you build one? So that's easy. Like once we get to the part where, okay, now you're prepared, you just have to understand the confluence of things that make up your frame of reference. You can think of it sort of as a mini personality. So your frame of reference is going to be dictated by your beliefs, your values, your identity, your habits, your routines, basically all the things that fall into the default network of the brain, anything that you do automatically. So when you get a grasp on those things and realize that all of them are malleable, like beliefs people often mistake for objective truth, and it simply isn't true. Like when you think about the fact that your brain is doing its best to create a virtual environment for you that is in no way, shape or form meant to objectively represent reality. Like just think of the narrow band of the light spectrum that we see, the narrow band of frequencies that we hear. Like it's really small and our brain has just gone, eh, these are the ones that matter to us. But if you did the same to a bat, it would crash and die. So it's like, it's different for every species. Every species took a different umwelt, if you will, strategy and said, okay, here are the things that I care about. Here are the things that I care about to optimize my environment. I think that the byproduct of the nature of the human animal is what you see, which is a deep propensity for um, self-loathing, which you you don't accidentally escape that. I think that it takes a lot of work for people to become something that they're proud of, to contribute meaningfully to the group. I think that we have so many mechanisms designed to keep us alive. Don't resent the negative voice in your head that is saying bad things about you. That was so important at a time where if you were ostracized, let's say you were a sailor and they 
left you on an island because you couldn't tell that you were pissing people off or that they didn't like you. Like that was some real life or death stuff. So all of these mechanisms served a purpose. We just have to now also be grateful for our ability to be self-aware, to learn about the brain, to be recursive in our thinking and go, hey, does that belief serve me? Let's talk about a really tangible example. So we're talking about um, beliefs that we have constructed. So a very common thing for people to have is negative self-talk, right? So, you know, I see it in friends. I see it uh, in patients. You know, I, I'm, you know, I can't stick to any diet. Okay, um, this always happens to me, right? So there are universal truths for sure, but are those statements universal truths? No, clearly not. So somebody who thinks, who is listening to this, who is um, he says, yeah, man, that's how I talk about myself. You know, I, I, I'm pretty hard on myself. I put myself down all the time. You know, I'm not the kind of person who exercises, you know, workouts, they're just not for me. You know, oh God, I'm the one who always gets passed up for that job promotion, right? Are these examples in your view of self-limiting beliefs that can be shifted? Definitively. And Definitively. Yeah, yeah. So in, every, the, in every case. A thousand percent. Those particular examples, one thousand percent. So my thing, a rule that I live by and a rule that I aggressively try to give anybody that will take it is only do and believe that which moves you towards your goals. So if you want to feel badly about yourself, then telling yourself, yeah, I always get passed up for a promotion. The world is against me like that. That is a dark place to live. Um, if you want to have the confidence that's needed, the lightness, the charm, like then you've got to internalize that. Oh man. Like if you add value, you're going to move forward in life. Like this is all going to work out. It's going to be amazing. Like the amount of almost delusional optimism you need to be a successful entrepreneur is hilarious because if you can't believe you certainly can't get anybody else to believe and so you've got to have this willingness to say things like that in your head like right now my stated goal is to build the next disney now you can imagine the odds of me pulling that off border on zero but i don't think like that i can't allow myself to think like that so it's like i have to say okay this is interesting enough to me and what i'm what I value myself for is the sincere pursuit. So I've completely divorced myself from the outcome. I don't care. Whether I do it or not is irrelevant. What I value myself for is did I show up every day and actually go for it? Not rhetoric. Did I actually go for it? Was I constantly checking myself? Am I actually making progress? Am I doing the right things? Could this possibly lead me where I want to go? And if it can, then I get to celebrate myself at the end of the day. And if it can't, I'm just BSing and I'm just saying things to like say something cool and get people's attention, then I don't get to feel good about myself. So when you are able to go, oh, it wouldn't behoove me to sit here and focus on this is impossible. There's only one Disney for a reason. I'm never going to be able to pull this off. Like if you can recognize that if you tell yourself you can't win, you will act in accordance with that belief. Like you will only push so hard. Whereas if you believe, no, 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 it's not going to be easy but through deliberate practice, I can get so good. I can learn all the things that I need to learn. I can get the right people excited. I can get people motivated. I can make mistakes. I'm gonna make a lot of mistakes, but I'm gonna learn from those mistakes. And I'm the kind of guy that learns from mistakes. I'm not afraid to make mistakes. I just keep trying and trying and trying. And people like being around me because I'm uplifting, I'm high energy, I'm a lot of fun. So I'm gonna be able to attract the right people. So when I meet somebody, I'm not thinking he's never gonna like me. Like you just, there's enough going against you to not be fighting yourself with self-defeating I'll even, I won't even say beliefs, just repeating self-defeating things, repeating even negative things. You just, you have to get your, understand the power of repetition. People do not understand the power of repetition. You repeat negative things, you're going to believe negative things. You repeat positive things. At first, it will sound like BS to you, but over time, you'll actually be very comfortable with the idea. This is different though, isn't it? From just saying the right things, because you shared that, you know, Back in the day, I don't know, maybe in your 20s, you would say, oh, wait, it started a lot younger. I am going to be rich, okay? I'm going to, I don't know if you said I'm going to be a success, but you were saying the right things, right? So you had that positive language, yep. yet you were not doing anything to actually make that come true, right? This is, this is not the secret. 
I'm not saying say positive things and everything changes. I'm just saying you remove one roadblock. Did you ever see The Secret? I have not yet. So I'll give it to you super fast. So The Secret is half amazing and half absolute BS. The half that's amazing says you, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. And that is true, dude. The, the, the way the mind works, man, if you believe it is possible, then you're the Roger Bannister effect. Yeah. It stood for decades. People thought that the four minute mile was humanly impossible, that the human body just couldn't do it. One guy was like, nope, it's not true. Ends up running the four minute mile. Okay. A, a barrier that stood for decades. He breaks the four minute mile. And then within 45 days, I think somebody else breaks the four minute mile. It stood for decades. And then within the year, three people break it in one race. So once you believe something is possible, all of a sudden it gets a lot easier. It's like the 100 meters. I remember as a kid, this, there was this magical 10 second mark, mm. right? I don't know when it got broken, but now in most races, everyone's under 10 <laughs> seconds. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's like at various things. It's the same kind of thing. So beliefs are powerful. Um, but I think it's, it is important to clarify that point because it's not just about saying the right thing. So again, trying to bring it back to a listener who may be struggling with their weight and yep. who has a bit of negative self-talk around that, that I, I just, I can't lose weight. I have tried, I've tried mm. every diet, you know, it's too hard. So they could hear this conversation and go, okay, I get what Tom's saying. I think I get what he's saying. I need to be positive. But you're not just saying you have to be positive, are you? You're saying something more difficult than that, or certainly something that requires a bit more work than that. So what is that that you are saying? Let's take that as an example. Somebody's trying to lose weight. They can't. They feel they tried every diet. They feel they can't get a consistent pattern going and working out, et cetera, et cetera. So break it down for them. Is it several steps? How do they start changing their mindset in that particular situation? Yeah, so when somebody is talking about weight loss, my first thing is always, you've got to love yourself where you are at. Now, that's not gonna be enough, and I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, just stare at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself you love yourself 10 times a day. It's not gonna work. But it really does have to come from a place of compassion. You're not gonna be able to whip yourself into great shape. Like you, one, have to get very comfortable that you're worth making the change, otherwise you're not gonna stick with it. And then two, you have to get to the laws of physics. So does anyone think that if I put them in a prison cell for three years and I gave them no food, that they would walk out morbidly obese? No, no right? N nobody thinks that. Now, they will think that's unreasonable. The person would die of malnutrition, which depending on your level of obesity is actually not true. And I think the longest water-only fast was something like 384 days. It was absurd. It was more than a year. So you can water only. I want to be very clear about that. So... No one, like if you really get down to brass tacks, everybody gets that no one is in a position where it would be impossible to lose weight. So then it becomes, okay, if we know that it's not impossible, then it becomes a question of what are you willing to do? Then you have to ask, am I willing to do what it's going to take? And if you're not, that's fine. Like it is an absolutely reasonable life to me to say, I know what it would take to get in better shape and I don't want to do it. Okay, cool. And, but if you're gonna live that life, I have one recommendation, live it fully really enjoy it. Say, my life is going to be a lot shorter than it would otherwise be. The one area where it gets tough is your level of inflammation is going to be so high that it's just going to be hard to enjoy your body. But let's say that you're able to get past that. Lean into it. Enjoy it. Relish it. I always tell people, the only thing that is heartbreaking Eating a bowl of ice cream is not heartbreaking. Eating a bowl of ice cream every day is not heartbreaking. Eating a bowl of ice cream and being sad about it and being ashamed of it, that's sad. That's heartbreaking. So whatever path you choose, know that you're a worthy human being, regardless of what path you choose. So now if it's like, well, I've tried the being out of shape path and, and I don't like that anymore and I wanna go to the other path, okay, Rad, let's get excited about that. Like, let's go all in. Emotions create habits. 
And specifically in tiny habits, what we focus on is the feeling of success. So when you do something and feel successful, that behavior becomes much more automatic. You're more likely to do it in the future. So if people can do a behavior like two push-ups or uh, you know, eat broccoli or any little thing and feel successful, then that behavior will become more automatic. And there's ways to hack that and help yourself create habits very quickly, very, very quickly, uh, if you know how to fire off a positive emotion. The other thing that the feeling of success does is it motivates you to do it again in the future. That's different than wiring in a habit into your brain. So that's, you know, effect number two is increases your motivation. And the third effect, uh, and there's more, but I'll stop here. Uh, I call it success momentum. As people do behaviors and feel successful, their confidence... Uh, it, you could call it self-efficacy, increases. And that means when they hit roadblocks or little bumps in the road, they can get through them. That's why I like calling it success momentum. They can get through it. And with that increased confidence, with that success momentum, then they can tackle other challenges in their life more effectively. So that and other reasons are why, you know, that maxim, you know, I only have three maxims, and that's number two. And it's just, it, if you're designing products and services, Bam, that's a key for you. If you're creating new habits in your life, that's a key. Help yourself feel successful. If you're coaching other people, helping other people like you do, that's another, you know, that's the same thing. Help them feel successful. Now, it's only four words, help people feel successful, but the way you do that can be challenging. And it's not obvious to everyday people of how, you know, the fact that they just set out their vitamins or took a sip of water, how they can feel successful about that. Uh, but people can learn uh, to bring up that emotion and wire in these ho positive habits really quickly. Yeah, yeah. It, it's incredible, really. And, and it, it very much marries up with what I've seen. Um, you mentioned that's what your next book is about. This is the Tiny well, Habits possibly. book? Well, the Tiny Habits, yeah. T Tiny Habits is out at the end of this year. Yeah. I don't know when this podcast ships, but uh, let's say January 1st, 2020, Tiny yeah. Habits is available. I think your work is incredible, and I think it will help people understand how to create a new behavior, yeah. but also help them understand maybe where they, you know, I don't like using the word where they went wrong before, but where mm. maybe in the past where they haven't succeeded, it might help them see, hey, oh, I get it. Yeah, or how people have handed them products and programs or they've seen them on TV and the internet and those products and programs were wrongheaded. They were poorly designed. And that's a big part of uh, what I hope people understand is if you've tried to change your behavior in the past and you didn't succeed, it is very likely not your fault. You are not the one that is lacking motivation or willpower. The program needed to be better and accurate. And there are so many programs out there that set people up to fail. And now I'm an optimistic guy. A lot of people think I'm a lot like Mr. Rogers, but <laughs> I get grumpy about this. When, when somebody, some company or some institution creates a behavior change program and it sets people up to fail, that's bad. That's, that's where I get really, that, that's where I get my grumpiest is when I see that. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm an optimist like you. I think this is one of the reasons why we're getting on so well in the last <laughs> couple of days. I, I always think people can make those changes uh, if we can communicate things in the right yeah, way. You, yeah. you, you say that it's not your fault. Um, I, my, my next book comes out the same time as yours, mm -hmm. uh, Feel yeah. Better in Five. And it actually, I think you're going to really like it because I think the program I've set out for people actually... A lot of it comes from my clinical research um, and my clinical experience. But also, I was trying to search through the research to try and figure out, well, why does this stuff work? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, your work has, has heavily influenced that part of the book in terms awesome. of explaining yeah. why it works. And I think you'll like the program. So we'll maybe talk about that a bit later. But let's go into specifics. So emotions create habits. Okay, yeah. I love that. Now, this is a story I, I shared with you yesterday, but I think it's worth exploring as to why this has worked so well. I've got my own view on it. Mm -hmm. but I, I'd, I, I'd love to hear your expertise on this. So a few years ago, I was in my practice. A patient came in to see me, had a whole variety of different problems. And I was coming across all the research on strength training at that time. And we had a long chat about it. And we felt that strength training would be a really good thing for him to do. It would help his physique. It would help his energy levels. It would help his mood. And he was, he was like, yeah, okay, doc, I get it. I, you've convinced me. Yeah. 
And he said, what do you want me to do? Would you like me to do 40 minutes three times a week in the gym? <laughs> I said, hey, yeah, that would be amazing if you can do that. And he said, right, okay, I'm going to do it. Okay, so he yeah. goes out oh, the no. door, yeah. really, really motivated, really inspired that, hey, I'm going to go <laughs> and do this. Four weeks later, he came in to see me at the follow-up. And I said, hey, how are you getting on? He said, Doc, you know what? I've actually not been to the gym yet. Uh, work's been busy. Um, the gym's quite far away from where I live. It's pretty expensive. I, I've just not got around to it. And he, and mm. he, he looked yeah. demoralized. And he felt a little bit sheepish that he was yeah. telling me this. He probably didn't even want to come to the appointment. Yeah, exactly. Right. But all credit to him, he did. And it was interesting because that moment really changed things for me. Because I thought... I didn't think for one minute, why is he not doing what I've asked him to do? Good. Because a lot of doctors say that, don't they? They say, oh, doc, you know, we tell patients what to do, but they don't do yeah. it. I've never really had that view. I've, Good. I felt in that moment, I'm clearly not giving him information that he feels is relevant for him in the context of his mm -hmm. own life. Mm -hmm. And I thought, right, I'm going to fix this. So I took my jacket off. <laughs> and I said to him, right, I'm going to teach you a workout right now. I love it. That you don't need to join a gym. You don't need to buy any equipment and you don't even need to get change to do. Nice. So what happens? <laughs> he goes away and I say to him, I want you to do this five minute workout in your kitchen mm -hmm. twice a week. Just twice a week. Just awesome. He, he's like, awesome. Well, just twice a week, Doc. What, just 10 minutes. I said, yeah. yeah, that's all I want you to do. Nice. And then I'll be happy. Nice. So he goes away, goes, yeah, I can do that, Doc. He goes away, comes back for his follow-up. And I said, how are you getting on? He says, Doc, I love this workout, right? I now do it for 10 minutes uh, every day in yeah. my kitchen before I have my evening meal. Yeah. So this is a chap who we had agreed before that strength training would be good for. Mm -hmm. The conventional way of doing that wasn't working for him. When I asked him to only do 10 minutes in his house a week, he comes back to me a few weeks later. He's doing 70 minutes. That's great. Of strength training right. every week. Yeah. And I wonder if you could sort of explore that and expand on why is that so successful? Wow. Okay. Well, let me start with, uh, you know, his ambition to do this huge workout. So when, often when people decide that they're going to change their behavior, they're in a high state of motivation. So if he's sitting down with you in the clinical setting, he's feeling motivated in that moment. And, in, and then he truly believes he can do these hard workouts. What he, what he doesn't and what we as human beings don't account for very well is what's going to happen to our motivation in the future. And the motivation goes up and down over time. And so, you know, three days later, his motivation sags. He's not able to do the hard workout. What you did so brilliantly is then you matched him with a really simple exercise routine that didn't require much time or money or physical effort, and you set the bar really low. And so if something's really easy to do, it doesn't require high levels of motivation. Motivation can be high or relatively low. He can still do it. And you were just right on to say, just do it two, two times a week. Um, so that was the bar. Now, what he did was he exceeded that. And you set him up to succeed, not fail. You set him up that the bar was low enough he could do it, so he felt successful. Then he did even more. So now he's feeling like a superstar. He's like the A-plus student. He's the student in the front row of the class that knows all the answers. And so that then helps him wire in the habit, and it helps him increase his motivation, which means he can do more and harder things. And I imagine as he was doing more than five minutes twice a week, every time he did it, he's like, oh my gosh, when I go back to the doctor, I get to tell him this and so on. And then that becomes part of his life and very importantly, part of his identity. He starts thinking, I'm the kind of person that does strength training. And more generally, I'm the kind of person who can change. Yeah. What you said there about identity really strikes a chord with me really, really deeply. You know, behavior change in so many ways is about identity yeah. change, mm -hmm. I've realized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by doing that and succeeding, he actually then, there was, a, there was what I call a ripple effect happened mm -hmm. after that. It, it led to more and more yeah. healthy behaviors yep off the back of that one thing that he could do. Yeah. And I think it's because of what you say, emotion is key. He's feeling good about mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. So he he's not the sort of person who fails anymore. He's the sort of person who succeeds. Right, you know? right. Um, yeah, so you, I mean, in my research, I see this week after week in tiny habits, 
week after week, about 75% of the people who do tiny habits report doing other behaviors besides the three uh, new habits that they uh, designed at the beginning. And this is within one week. So they start doing other behaviors. About 18% of people do a big change within those five days. Not one that was planned, not that one that was part of the tiny habits program or what they thought they would do, but change leads to change. Uh, and success leads to success. And this dynamic of you do something and feel successful, your identity shifts, and then that naturally ripples out and affects other behaviors in your life. And I didn't, in the first, I would say, three years of doing tiny habits, I saw the data. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. These ripple effects are there. I get it. But what about these big leap changes that people are making, this 18%? And I didn't totally understand that until I started asking uh, some other questions in the research. And I did see clearly that as people do something and feel successful, it shifts their identity in these positive ways. And then they naturally start doing other uh, related healthy behaviors. Yeah. And that's just like, to me, it's just like, wow. Okay, so you don't have to have people change 40 things at once or do this huge thing. You just have to help them feel successful on something really, really small. And that works. And then that has these big effects if you do it right. And you did. I'm, I'm, I, I find that when I teach doctors or teach health coaches, which is something I'm doing a lot more of these days, is this is a key thing. I always say find you know, find your leverage point, find mm -hmm. the thing that they're passionate about, find the thing that actually they can do and start there. Yeah. Because it also, it, it all marries up with what your research is saying, which is, you know, and, and actually on many levels, it's it kind of makes common sense, right? If we feel good yeah. about ourselves, <laughs> we, we're going to start doing more things. Yeah. Um, well, yes, it makes common sense. But then you look at the traditional products and programs for behavior change, yeah. and they don't set you up that way. They have you set a very ambitious goal, they have you track it daily so you can see evidence that you're failing. And then they put you on guilt trips by putting you in groups or having a leaderboard and who's winning and who's not winning. All those things are not ways to set people up to feel successful. It's just the opposite. So, you know, when you see it from a certain perspective, um, you go, wow, is it, it's, you know, can it, it's frustrating that, that, that somehow the products and programs decades ago set people up to fail in these ways. And some of those things like goal setting and tracking and keep yourself motivated have become institutionalized. And a lot of my work is like saying, hey, set those things aside. If they don't work for you, you don't have to set an explicit goal. You don't have to track your behavior. You can change your behavior perhaps better without doing those things. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, and again, you were very careful to say, if that's not working for you, yeah. d don't do it. And yeah. and. Of course, there may be people listening to this who say, well, actually, goal setting does work for me or tracking it does yeah. work for me. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Keep going with that. Yeah. Um, you've been running this Tiny Habits program now for you know, many years. You've been teaching, as you said, thousands and thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So I guess you will have developed insights, maybe in, maybe in a similar way to me as a clinician, but also in a different way. People who are coming here probably are quite engaged to, mm -hmm. okay, BJ is the world's leading expert in this field. He's going to help me start to change some of my mm -hmm. own behaviors. Mm -hmm. right? So they're coming here with a high level of motivation, I'm guessing. Yeah. With all these groups that you've taken through your program, what are the common things that people are looking for help with? What are the common wow. habits yeah. that people are saying, I want to do this, but I can't? Yeah. Because I bet you they Love must it. be similar to what, the listeners of this podcast oh, absolutely. are also trying oh, to do in their own lives. Okay, well, let me be clear about this. There's kind of two different buckets here. One is the Tiny Habits program that's free online. It's five days and, you, and we interact through email. And that's the program uh, that I've been running since 2011 and has, that I measure week by week and have all this data around. And so that, um, and that now I have trained coaches because I can't, yeah, you know, I can't coach everybody personally. I mean, this is personal coaching where I read the emails and I respond and so on. And so that's one. The second one is what you're here for now is my boot camp in behavior design, which is professionals here that are creating products and services to help people change behavior. But like you said, 
people come here, even though they come here for professional reasons, they're still thinking, how do I help my kid do their homework? How do I, I get my family to help your fit? So the topics are, and you probably see this all the time, people do care about being fit and looking fit to others. Boom. So there's fitness, whether you call it weight loss or whatever. And part of that is driven by, they want to look good to other people. At the end of the day, uh, we're all kind of vain and we do care about what others think about <laughs> us. I mean, frankly, we do. Another piece of that has to do with energy. And you've talked about this a lot. Uh, well, I need better energy. Um, people need to want to be more productive. I don't think that's the number one thing in their mind, but it's there more and more these days. It's like, how do I stay focused? The ability to focus. In fact, some research I did on, it was about 60 different aspirations in that particular research. Um, people staying focused was the number one item well above weight loss, surprisingly. And wow. I think this is a moving target, right? As social media and other things evolve, people's concerns shift. And um, certainly parents are thinking about how do I help my child succeed? How do I help my child create the positive habits that will help them be happier and healthier and more successful? And it just seems like parents are, of course, pretty obsessed with that. Yeah. Uh, incredible. These are, these are universal themes, aren't they, that pretty much all of us want in yeah. our lives. Um, are there specific personal habits that people keep coming back with? Like, you know, I would like to meditate mm. every day. Although you've yeah. got interesting views on meditation, yes, haven't I you? Yes, I You think it's a hard thing uh, it's to It's a get? very difficult habit to form. Yes, people do want to meditate. You know, there's a lot of talk about mindfulness and uh, a lot of emphasis on meditation. And I think meditation is a great thing. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it is a hard habit to form and it's hard to form because as people start meditating, they do not feel successful. They sit there and they recognize how busy their mind is. And that's not a feeling of success. Uh, so not only does it take time and not only do people not have perhaps enough training in meditation, those are barriers. But if you do something and you don't feel successful, that thing is very unlikely to become a habit in your life. Now there's ways to reframe meditation. So people do are not so concerned that they're, you know, there's like a thousand monkeys in their head chattering, that they look at something else for success. But I think most people think, okay, I'm going to calm my mind. It's not calming. It's not calming. I'm terrible at this. Oh, I, I'm just awful at this. And for that reason, that that's what I would hone in on and identify as the problem with making meditation a habit is it's not helping people feel successful, at least in ways that people seem to typically do it. Yeah, I think for me, when it's shifted with meditation is when I stop beating myself up mm. for having a busy mind. Yeah. So my sort of, particularly in the in the past, my sort of A-type personality, it was like, you know, I want to be able to do something and master it and do it really, mm -hmm. really well. Yeah. And I was like, hey man, I can't do this meditation thing and I'm, I can't clear my mind. And it was almost becoming a stress yeah. that I couldn't do it. But I've, I, as I studied it more and I talked to more and more teachers, I understood that actually it's not about clearing your mind. It's about being detached and observing. So now when I do it, mm -hmm. it's about looking at my mind. And some days, yeah, I hit a Zen-like state and I feel great. Other days I go through my to-do list and I go, oh, yeah, you've got a busy yeah. mind today. And it's so for me, I've had to reframe it. And that's Good. really helped. Awesome. But I think that the take home for me for people listening to this might be, maybe if you've tried meditation, and you can't get into it, maybe it's not the right habit for you at this particular mm -hmm. moment in time, maybe work on some other ones that are quick wins yeah. and easy wins that make you yeah. feel good, right? Yeah, absolutely. One powerful way to think about habits in your life is to think about them as plants. And so imagine you have this garden uh, and each plant in the garden is a habit. Now you can just uh, not design the garden and let weeds grow, bad habits. So think just whatever happens, happens. Or you can design the garden and decide what you want here and there and so on. And as you know, if you, when you garden, sometimes a plant just isn't in the right spot. It's not gonna, it's not gonna flourish there. It's the wrong time of year. And that's uh, the garden metaphor and habits or the garden analogy and habits is a really, really good way to think about it. It's like, where does this new habit fit naturally in my life? And if for some reason it just doesn't take root and the root is like the automaticity, how firmly does it uh, become part of your life? That's not your fault. It's like, maybe it's the wrong spot in your life. Maybe it's the wrong time of year. Maybe, you know, three months from now, there'll be a perfect time to bring in meditation into your life. So if it's not working, redesign it 
And if you just can't redesign it and nail it, that's fine. Move on and work on other things. You know what? It, you just made me think of something I've not thought about in a long time. And that's with quite a lot of my patients. I, when they want to make a certain change, um, whether it's a lot of the time it's getting more active and sometimes mm. it's, you know, in the UK, let's say it's in January and it's dark and it's <laughs> cold and, you know, I, I often say to them, hey, look, should we work on something else at the moment? Right. And, you know, or in February, I say, hey, why, why don't we wait for that one until March or April? Because yeah. it's going to be spring. Yeah. It's going to get brighter. And I think you're going to actually want to do that more. I think it's going to be easier for you to do it then. Let's figure, let's work on something else now. Perfect. And I guess that really, I like it because it marries up with your, with your garden, your plants analogy is there is a different time for different things. Yeah. And I guess the more we can tune into that, the more likelihood there is to success. Exactly, right on. And if people think of that analogy, you know, in your garden, you don't plant something and want to, you know, expect it to be there for years and years and years. You want to evolve it. And that's just like our set of habits. Uh, just because you started a habit and if you get tired of it or it doesn't do, do you much good, you can remove it and put something else in its place. And so people tend to have this very rigid thinking about habits like, okay, I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to walk every day for 60 minutes and I must stick to that because at one moment in time, I set that down as what I was going to do. That's not the right way to think about it. It's sort of like, ah, here's this thing I can design. I'll try something here. And if it works, I'll keep going. And if it doesn't, I'll shift and try something else and spot and so on. And so there's kind of a playfulness uh, that really helps when it comes to behavior yeah. change. Like you're exploring, you're goofing around, you're designing, you're redesigning. You know you're not going to be perfect. You're not even trying to be perfect. You're exploring to find what fits really well. What's the perfect garden for you in that moment? Knowing that plants will die and move on, you'll replace them, you'll evolve it, your taste will change, your capability will change, the seasons will change, and you just keep evolving it in ways that make you happy and healthy and uh, that are fun, really. Well, let's, let's dive into creating new habits because um, clearly it's something we're all working on at various times in our life. No matter what state of health or yeah. well-being we yeah. have, there's generally always something we're, we're trying to introduce uh, with, with varying degrees of success. So, you know, to be blunt, how do you create a new habit? Yeah, it's easier than people think. Uh, there's basically three steps. You take whatever behavior you want and you scale it down so it's super tiny. So you did this well for your patient. Rather than having him think 40 minutes, you scaled it back to five minutes. In tiny habits method, you go even more extreme. It's like, what? It's just like two push-ups or two squats. Super, super simple. So you scale it back to be really tiny, and then you find where it fits naturally in your routine. What does it come after? Um, so for example, if you want to floss your teeth, you don't floss all your teeth, you floss just one, you scale it way back. I know that sounds ridiculous, but there's a difference between one tooth and all your teeth. And then you find what it comes after. Well, it naturally comes after brushing. So then it's called the recipe in Tiny Habits. The recipe is after I brush, I will floss one tooth. Or it could be things like after I feed the dog, I'll get out my journal and start writing. You know, And not write a page, you just get out the journal and open it. So you find where this you scale it back. You it's like you're starting a little seed. So let's go back to the garden analogy. You, ha you don't start out a huge plant and try to transplant it. You start it out really small. You find where it fits naturally in your routine. And then when you do that new behavior, you help yourself feel good about it. In Tiny Habits, we have a t technique called celebration, which allows you to feel a positive emotion in the moment, which then rewires your brain. So your brain goes, wow, I just felt really good. What just happened? Oh, I did this and this and I flossed that tooth and I felt really happy. I'm going to, wow, I'm going to do that again in the future. Sorry to interrupt. If you're enjoying this conversation, there's loads more like it on my channel. Please do press subscribe and hit that bell. Now, back to the conversation. If you really want to get a habit to stick for the long run, the social environment plays a huge role. And in fact, if you look at many habits that we do stick to for 20 or 30 or 40 years, there's often a very strong social component. Um, things like, uh, you know, say you move into a new neighborhood and you walk outside and you see your, uh, you see your neighbor mowing their lawn or trimming the hedges and you think, oh, I need, to, I need to mow the lawn. You may stick to that habit for as long as you live in the house. And partially it's because you want to have a clean lawn 
but mostly it's because you don't want to be judged by the other people in the neighborhood. And so it's actually the social expectation that gets that habit to stick. And that's true for all kinds of tribes that we're a part of, uh, whether it's the people we work with or um, the people that we live around or the volunteering that we do, whatever it is. Um, all those tribes, large and small, have a set of social expectations for how to act and what's normal. And those social norms often influence which habits we stick to in the long run. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We have something in the UK that's called social prescribing at the moment, which is really taking off. And it's this idea that as doctors, instead of asking a, a patient, an individual patient to try and make changes by themselves, we try and tap them in to a local group where they're already doing that behavior. A, a classic example is something called Park Run, which is, you know, transforming the health of the UK. Do you know, are you familiar with Park Run? No, I haven't heard about it. Yeah, Park Run is, it is basically every Saturday in local parks, people get together to run a 5k or walk a 5k. But you do it together. Um, they've got a motto that I, I think it's something like no one comes last. Um, mm. So there's always a tail walker to be the very last person in. It's very supportive. And it really it's transformed my relationship with running because I rock up until the pandemic every Saturday with my son. And I know all I have to do is, is arrive at the venue. Once I'm there, whether I'm tired, whether I'm not feeling it, I will end up completing 5K. And, you know, as doctors, we're really starting to learn, actually, that the way we've been advising people to do things is potentially a little bit short-sighted and not helpful in the long term. Yeah, that's a great example. I think the punchline for me usually comes down to you want to join a group to join a tribe where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. Yeah. Because if it's normal in that group, it's going to become very attractive and natural for you to stick to it. Because our behaviors are not just something we do um, from a practical standpoint for ourselves. They also are signals to the people around us. And by finding tribes where your desired behavior is the normal behavior, the good habit that you want to build becomes the signal to those other people. Hey, I get it. I fit in. I'm part of this. I belong. And belonging is one of the deepest needs that we all have. And if you have to choose between, I get the habits that I want to have, but I don't really belong. I don't fit in. I'm kind of cast out or I'm going against the grain of the social norm. Or I have habits that I don't really love, but I get to fit in and I belong most people will choose belonging over loneliness. The desire to belong often overpowers the desire to improve. And so you want to make sure you get those two things aligned. And even further to your point about being a doctor, this, I mean, this influences things. It's almost like a fish being in water where it's like, what is water? You know, like when you go to the hospital or go to see patients, you could wear a bathing suit, but that would be weird, right? So instead you wear a white lab coat or a suit and tie or whatever, like, we don't dress that way. We we have a habit of which clothes we put on, largely because that would be it would violate all the social expectations and norms for what it means to visit someone in a hospital or what it means to go to the doctor. And that type of thing happens all over the place. It's again, it's like a fish in water it surrounds us constantly. Like, why do you ring doorbells or knock on doors before you walk in? Because it would be weird to barge into someone's house without doing that, right? Like we have a habit of, of doing things that way. And there's a social expectation that you ask for permission before you step inside someone's home. Yeah. And so the social environment in that way, just it has such a strong influence on the habits and behaviors that we repeat again and again. And you can go against the grain of the social norm, the social norm for a little bit. But if you want to stick to a habit for years, I think you got to have some kind of community or some kind of social norm that's working with you uh, rather than against you. Yeah. I, I mean, really, really uh, helpful advice to people. If someone's listening to this and they think, okay, James, I get that, but I've tried. And, you know, my friends, the ones who I like hanging out with, don't have those behaviors. They still like boozing every night. They still like, you know, having big tubs of ice cream when I'm actually trying to stop doing that, you know, what can I do then? Have you sort of picked up any helpful tips along the way that, that will help people who struggle getting those social, getting, getting that social environment aligned with what they want as well? 
Yep. Yeah. I don't, um, you know, certainly there is a time and a place for having to cut things out of your life entirely, but I don't know that that's necessary. Uh, most of the time, I do think for many habits, you need at least some kind of, we can call it like a sacred space where it can happen, uh, where you're not actually f- going against the grain of things. Like, let's say that you want to start doing yoga consistently or start running consistently. Um, if you grow up or live in you know a flat of all people who are fairly athletic and interested in that, well, it's a lot more natural to do that. Whereas if your family, nobody's interested in working out with you, or they kind of criticize you when you put the yoga video on, um, then th- then you're kind of fighting this uphill hill battle. You don't really have a sacred space for that. So you know, um, finding somewhere, whether it's, it's a little harder here during the pandemic, but you know, usually we could say going to a yoga studio for a class. Uh, where at least for that hour, you're surrounded by people who your desired behavior is the normal behavior. Um, So that's one thing. The other thing, though, is the more precise you get about what you actually want, um, the less likely you are to find that generally just kind of hanging out in the world, because your your goals are specific to you. And uh, so what you may find, and I've had to do this, is that you may need to create the tribe rather than stumble into one or find one naturally. So as an example, um, you know, my, uh, my business, my uh, career is to be an author, but I really view myself more as like an online business person as an entrepreneur. And so I have looked and sought out other entrepreneurs who have similar businesses as me, they started with a newsletter, they write books now. And um, I've reached out to all of them cold, uh, slowly developed relationships with some of them. And then once I had talked to say 25 or 30 people like that, I had five or six or eight that I really got along well with. And so I invite those people out to a retreat each year where we all kind of get together in person for, you know, three or four days. And I take care of organizing it all. Everybody pitches in money and splits the cost. And it's really valuable for all of us because it's not the kind of group that we would just stumble into, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't just be able to naturally find that social environment. So you may find that you need to create it. Uh, in order for for you to be surrounded by people who really do share your objectives and your goals and your values. Um, but I think that's very much worth it. It's it's 100% worth the effort for me. Yeah, I mean, it's a great example to share. And you, you did mention the pandemic. And I guess in some ways that has presented new opportunities. So what I mean by that is, yes, I can no longer go to my yoga class, for example. But actually, there's a litany now of uh, Zoom yoga classes. And you can probably, through social media, through the internet, find, actually sort of trial out until you find your perfect tribe, which may even be meeting on a daily basis. Um, I don't know if you've been doing many interviews during the pandemic at all, but I'm, I'm interested as to whether you feel the way the world has changed over the past six months, has that harmed the creation of new habits? Or has that helped the creation of new habits? Um, Well, anytime behavior changes, or sorry, anytime the environment changes in a big way, behavior changes in a big way. And many of us throughout the pandemic have felt or seen our environment change in really meaningful ways. It used to be that you went into the office, but now your office is the kitchen table or the pantry used to be miles away from you most of the day, but now it's right around the corner and you can snack whenever you want. And so those shifts in environment have definitely led to a shift in behaviors, a creation of new habits. Now, not necessarily all good habits, but it's definitely been uh, a shift. I do think, however, we can ask ourselves, you know, what is... One of the things that I like to come back to when we talk about designing habits is what is the path of least resistance? So how can I make the good habits the obvious and easy thing to do in this environment? And when we all have our environment shift and we're working from home and different things are happening, um, you're in an environment that you probably have not optimized before, uh, at least not for the certain set of habits that are being performed in it now. So I'll give a couple personal examples. Um, I knew I'd be spending more time at home during quarantine and the pandemic and so on. And I figured, well, I'd like to use at least some of that time productively. So I want to read a little bit more. So I bought some books off my reading list. I have like four or five of them next to me right now on the desk. I put a couple down on the coffee table, one or two next to my bed. So I kind of sprinkling books throughout the house so that it's the path of least resistance to read them. I also took all the apps that are on the home screen of my phone, and I move those to a second screen. 
And then I took Audible and I put that on the home screen, right in the home bar. So it was the first thing that I would see when I would open up my phone, just to remind me to listen to another audiobook. And so what I'm trying to do is to prime my environment for more productive action, right? To make the good habit the, la- the path of least resistance. And what you often see, if you look around people's environments, we have, you know, people can have good intentions. We can have all kinds of things that we would like to do. But the habits that we often actually spend time on are often the path of least resistance. Like if you take a, a lot of people feel like they watch too much TV or they watch more Netflix than they would like or whatever. But if you walk into any living room, where do all the couches and chairs face, right? So it's like, what is this room designed to get you to do? And I'm not saying that you have to, you know, get rid of your television or something, but you could place it inside a a cabinet or a wall unit so that it's behind doors, you're less likely to see it. You could take the chair that you usually sit in to watch television, you could turn it and have it face a coffee table with a book on it. You could take the remote control, put it inside a drawer, put a book in its place. Um, And, you know, no single choice like that is going to radically transform your behavior. But you can imagine the impact of making a dozen or two dozen or 50 little choices like that throughout your uh, environment that all kind of prime the more productive action. And suddenly it becomes a lot easier to stick to good habits when they're the path of least resistance. Yeah, Uh, such a good point. And as you you were describing that, I thought about my living room at the moment. And, you know, I've got three, three books in there that I'm, I'm sort of dipping in and out of at the moment. We've also started unplugging the television and the the Virgin sort of cable box. And actually, if you have to plug them in before you put it on and before you load up Netflix, that is that is sometimes a five minute procedure for it to, you know, turn it on, it to load up. That is enough. That is enough friction between me watching Netflix again. Ah, you know what? I'm just going to read the book. Um, and it's surprising how little friction you need for a bad habit to kind of fade away. Like another similar example to that, I um, I've been doing this for the last year or two, where I, I have this little habit where I try to start my day by leaving my phone in another room until lunch. And it doesn't work for everybody, but it works well for me. And what I find is if I have my phone next to me, if it's if I bring it in, I'm like everybody else, I check it every three minutes, you know, but if it's in a different room, I have a home office. And so it's only like 30 seconds away. But I never go get it. And I'm like, well, did I want it or not? You know, in the one sense, I wanted it bad enough to check it every three minutes when it was next to me. But in another sense, I never wanted it so bad that I would work 30 seconds to go get it. And um, I've seen the same thing with beer. If I buy like a six pack of beer, and I put it in the front of the fridge. If I have it right there where I can see it when I open up the door, I'll grab one every night just because it's there. But if I tuck it down on the lowest shelf, and I put it like kind of to the back of the fridge where I can barely even see it. Um, sometimes I'll forget it's there for weeks. Yeah. And it's surprising that that little bit of friction can lead to a change in your behavior. You know, I don't think those things will solve like a true addiction. But most people aren't dealing with that. In many cases, uh, you'll be surprised how much you can curtail your bad habits just by making them less obvious and a little more difficult to do. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll maybe touch back on addiction later, if there's time. But it, that that is such a great example, James, because you're bringing, you're still bringing beer into the house. You're just hiding it. You're making it invisible, which is changing your behavior. So, you know, I've always said to my patients, try and control the environments you can control, right? You can't control what's outside your front door. So for people who are, let's say, trying to lose weight, for example, if they feel that that's going to benefit them for their health, I will often say, well, which are the foods you're trying to eat more of? Which are the ones you're trying to eat less of? let's not bring the ones you're trying to eat less of into the house in the first place. But you're saying even if you do bring stuff into the house, there are tricks you can do just to make them that little bit harder to access, which I think is a really helpful tip for people. Well, the more friction there is between you and a bad habit or an undesirable behavior, the less likely you are to do it. So if the food that you want to avoid, the junk food that you're trying to not eat, if it's, you know, um, 15 minutes away at the store, that's a lot of friction. Um, If it's in the house, that's much less friction, but it's better if it's on the highest shelf in the pantry or tucked away at the bottom of the fridge or, you know, um, down in the basement in the cellar or something like these, you know, anywhere where you can add more friction, make it less visible, make it less obvious, increase the number of steps between you and the behavior like you did when you unplugged the television. 
um, you know, that's just a little bit of extra friction and all of that stuff adds up uh, and is, is helpful in kind of guiding your behavior towards uh, the path of least resistance. Yeah, <laughs> reminds me of one of my patients who actually couldn't stop eating crisps. Uh, so I think you guys call them potato chips. Sure, um, yeah. And he, the solution we ended up finding after trying to tweak it for a little while is he would put them in his garden shed. So he had to, you know, in the UK in the winter, you probably don't want to get out of the door, go into yep. your garden, get to the shed. And it worked. It was, you know, it, it is amazing. I think, I think we often, what, what I think is beautiful about your book, actually, there's, there's many things about it that, that, are, that are just frankly fantastic. But you've actually, you've really helped to codify something that we all do on a daily basis, often without thinking about it. Uh, and I want to explore that a little bit with you. I, I, either in the book or, or in a previous interview, I've heard you say that where we are at the moment in life is a result of the habits that we have or something to that effect. So I wonder if you could maybe expand upon that a little bit, because I think it's a really interesting concept. Well, you know, there are a variety of things that influence your outcomes in life. Probably if we we're going to say there are like two or three big pillars, we probably would say, well, there's luck and randomness. So certainly, you know, good luck and bad luck influence your outcomes. There's your choices, uh, individual decisions you make, where to go to school, who to marry, what job to take, what career to pursue. Those certainly influence your outcomes. And then there are your habits and your actions. And, um, you know, by definition, the first one, luck and randomness is not under your control. So you, you, I don't think it makes sense to focus there because you don't have control over it uh, by definition. Now your choices, we, you know, we could talk more about that, about that possibly, but the one that I've explored the most is your habits. And the reason is because they are decisions, they're, they're also choices, but they're ones that get repeated day in and day out. And I think for that reason, they exert an enormous force on your outcomes in life. And we could potentially, as you just mentioned, sort of boil it down and simplify it and say that your current life today is largely the sum of your habits. Um, in many ways, it's the habits that you've been following for, say, the last six months or the last year, or the last two years that have carried you to whatever results you have right now. Um, I had a friend who told me a couple months ago, I thought it, I liked the way he phrased it. He said, if you're enjoying good results right now, you were killing it six months ago. And I, I think that speaks to the quality of habits and how they build up and compound. And it's really the process that you've been running. And I like to kind of simplify this down and use, I use the phrase system versus goal. And so what I say is that like you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And if we're a little bit more precise about those words, your goal is like your desired outcome. It's your target, the thing that you want to achieve. But what is your system? Your system is the collection of daily habits that you follow. And so each little habit is kind of like a gear in that overall machine. And if you optimize your habits, you're optimizing your system and you naturally uh, fall to whatever that level of result is, to whatever the system is running toward. If there is ever a gap between your goal and your system, if there's ever a gap between your desired outcome and your daily habits, your daily habits will always win. It doesn't matter how good your intentions were. It doesn't matter what you hope to achieve. It's what your habits are carrying you toward. And so the kind of the great irony of all of this is we also badly want better results in life. You know, we also badly want to make more money or to reduce stress or to find love or to be more productive. But the results are actually not the thing that needs to change. It's the system that precedes the results. It's the habits that precede the outcome. So it's kind of like fix the inputs and the, outs the outputs will fix themselves. Why is it that we don't sort of intuitively get that. Why is it, you know, classic case, January the 1st every year where it's, okay, complete lifestyle overhaul, um, get to the gym three times a week, eat completely perfect whole foods, you know, don't bring any sugar in the house. And it lasts for about two weeks or three weeks at the most for, for many people. And then if they're not seeing results, you know, there's something, isn't there, in the human psyche that actually we we judge the success of our habits maybe a little bit too early, I guess. I really like what your friend said about how you are now is what you were doing six months ago. That's it's such a beautiful way to think about it. But but what's going on there with human psychology that we sort of we don't quite see it. Yeah, 
I, I don't know that I have a perfect example or uh, answer, but I, a couple things that come to mind. Like one is that I think at a very deep fundamental level, at like a biological level, humans are goal seeking organisms. Um, you know, like in to some sense, in some degree, maybe it's subconscious, but you have a goal of finding food and water. You have a goal of seeking shelter. And it's the objective of satisfying your thirst that motivates you to take action. So we kind of, I feel like it's probably wired into us at some deep level to uh, have goals and results. And so because of that, we have a tendency to kind of overfocus on, on that um, when it is applied to, say, the modern world and not to like just our, our physical existence. Um, the other challenge, and I think modernity just kind of magnifies this or accelerates it, is that whether it's the daily news cycle or social media, it tends to be very results focused. It tends to be very results oriented. So, you know, you're never going to see a news story that says something like man eats chicken and salad for lunch today, right? It's only going to be a story when it's like man loses, you know, all this weight or uh, it's only, we only hear about the Broadway play once it's a hit, not when it's being written, right? We only hear about the um, successful team after they've won the championship, not while they're training in the off season. And so the results of success are often highly visible and discussed, and the process of success is often hidden from view. And uh, for that reason, I think we tend to overvalue results and undervalue the process that you know precedes it, the, all the the work that comes before. So I think you know society tends to be very outcome oriented and results oriented. And um, certainly results matter. And this is this, again, is like one of the little ironies or kind of competing tensions of this. I'm not saying that results don't matter. They do. But people who focus only on results win one time. People who focus on systems win again and again. And so the place that you want to focus is on building better habits and developing better systems, um, not necessarily achieving a particular outcome. Yeah. Yeah, so much for people to reflect on there, I think. Um, you know, if we think about habits, and, and often we call habits good or bad, and it's really interesting because I think, I think sitting underneath habits in the book, and, and I really, it's funny, I, I read the book when it first came out, uh, I actually quoted uh, some of your book in my third book, which just came out in America, which you may not have seen yet, but I quote... Oh, thank you. Uh, not at all, I quote one of your lines in the conclusion there. Um, Congrats, by the way. Finishing any book is a huge project, so congratulations. Yeah. You've, you've done three. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I submitted my fourth manuscript last week, so I'm barely still alive and functioning, actually. But um, I, like the, uh, I like the phrase that I think Sam Harris used it where he said... Um, Writing a book is often like having a baby, except bloodier. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's, you know, it's quite a battle. My my PA said to me last week, she's she said, Ron, I thought you'd finished in June. I was like, yes, so did I. I thought I was done. She goes, I'm just on the final bit now. But, you know, June bled into July, into August, into September. Um, but, you know, as I revisited this morning, and I haven't looked at it for, for maybe over 12 months, actually, right? So it was, it was really nice uh, to revisit it. And I've actually been prompted to maybe put it into my living room and make it one book that I reread now from start to finish. But it's really interesting to me that although on the surface it's about habits, what strikes me is actually it's really about awareness. And what you're really doing is helping shine a light on people as to how they're spending their time, what are they doing? And actually, I don't know how spiritually inclined you are, but actually there's a real spiritual component to the book I found because you're helping people, you're actually helping us understand ourselves better. And I think that's one of the most powerful things that any of us can give another human being is the ability to understand themselves. You know, you were teaching us yesterday about this very a powerful relationship between motivation um, and ability to do something, you know, mm -hmm. motivation mm -hmm. and ease and how that mm -hmm. motivation does come in waves. So you mm -hmm. can't really rely on motivation long-term. Right. Because I think most public health messaging, you know, kind of relies on that, relies on sort of, we're going to give you information. We're going to tell you how bad this is, how important it is to do this. And we're hoping by giving you that information, it's going to motivate you <laughs> to consistently make these choices. Yet we know 
that it's frankly yeah. not working because all this information we're giving people is not leading to a change in action. So I wonder if you could just expand on, you know, this motivation wave and yeah. how important it is to understand that and be aware that our motivation and I guess our willpower will run out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what's interesting about the academic work on motivation, as far as I can tell, and I've looked really hard at it, the uh, research about how motivation works and the fact that it shifts up and down over time, that was not studied or published until 2007. And it came out in two separate fields that year. Before that time, I can find no academic work that talks about motivation shifting uh, day by day, hour by hour, even moment by moment. So it's not been part of the academic tradition. But you know, I know, everyone knows motivation shifts over time. It's really high at the beginning of the year. It's higher on Sundays for some things. It's higher on Mondays for other things. Motivation shifts around. And so the, somehow that just ha hadn't become part of the academic work, the understanding that motivation shifts. Now, one of the boot camps uh, a number of years ago, I was explaining this concept. I didn't have a word for it yet, but it's like, yeah, motivation will go up and it will peak. And it's at those moments when it's high we can get ourselves to do hard things or other people do hard things, but it's gonna come down because that's how it works. And I said, let's name this. And one of the guys at the boot camp, and he's a doctor, Dr. David Sobel, a friend of mine, an MD was there, a, wow. a GP. He's like, let's call it motivation wave. And wow. I was like, thank you, David. It's perfect. Cause it's like a wave goes up, but you know, it's coming back down. Some waves are bigger than others. Some are little ripples. It's, and so that's what, uh, that's what it's called in behavior design is the motivation wave. And I guess that really feeds into um, this whole idea of helping people feel successful, because if you know that your motivation will go down, and that's the natural yeah. course of motivation, then maybe hopefully people will stop beating themselves up when their motivation yeah, does normal. wane, because they think, oh, I can't do it. You know, I'm, I'm just not motivated enough. I don't yeah. have the willpower yeah. to do this. And actually, maybe, again, the language has been used in an unhelpful way, mm -hmm. because actually... That is normal for most patients to come and go. So um, in, in the new program I've got out in, in, in Feel Better in Five, where every single health intervention takes five minutes That's great. maximum. That's great. Awesome. And you want to do more? You can do more. But Perfect. you get the credit if you've done your five yeah. minutes. Awesome. And I say, look, when your motivation's high, when you bought the book, right, use it to learn one mm -hmm. of these. I mean, there's many things in the book, but one of them are workouts. Use your motivation to learn how to do this particular workout, right. right? So you learn it when your motivation is high. But then after a few days of doing it, you will know it. You won't need to refer to the book. You won't need to look at the video. And so when your motivation's low, you're not going to have to, you know, you're not going to have to always come back and go, oh God, right. how do I do that? Because as soon as we add those steps, the more steps we add, the, hot, the easier it is to say no to doing exactly. a new behavior. And exactly. that's why I'm asking them to do, do the same workout every yeah. day yep. at the same time. Yep. Yeah, there's another 10 workouts in the book. Choose one mm -hmm. and stick to it. Mm -hmm. Because then you're using what your research and science shows. You're using, you know, all of these um, factors that you describe, willpower, motivation, ease, um, you know, all the science behind how you create a new habit. I think it's all in there. It's yeah. all sort of... It's all built into the design of that program. Yeah, I, you know, I'm excited to hear how it goes for your readers. Uh, these five minute workouts, I think it's right on. It's setting people up to succeed. They choose the ones that they want to do, uh, and hopefully they keep the bar low. They don't say, "Oh, I did five, now I have to do 10. Yeah, you can do ten or fifteen. You can knock it out of the park. The days you're feeling motivated. So, from my research, I draw general. Uh, principles out of it. And one of them is that behavior change is a skill. It's a set of skills, just like playing the piano or the guitar. So you can say, oh, I have the skill of playing the piano. Well, it's uh, fingering, it's, it's phrasing, it is rhythm, and so on. People should look at behavior change in the same way. It's a set of skills. I map it into five categories. And one of those skills is knowing when to push yourself further, like do more than the two push-ups or more than five minutes and knowing when not to, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're just not into it, you're busy, you're sick, just do the minimum, congratulate yourself and move on. But other times you'll want to push it. And this is how 
habits that begin tiny can expand. Uh, push-ups is pretty easy to understand. So you do more push-ups to a point where it just barely starts hurting, but not to the point where you hate it. And so you learn how do you go to the edge. And by going to the edge, you expand your capacity and you expand your understanding of, oh, I'm going to push myself on push-ups. Oh, I'm going to go this far. Awesome. But not so far that it really hurts. Now, um, if you do push yourself into pain, then if you celebrate extra hard, if you go, yeah, my muscles are burning, but good for me. Look how many I did and look what I, then you, I, uh, then that seems to offset the, the pain that would have, uh, caused the roots of the habit to shrivel. So, uh, all this is to say that behavior change is a set of skills. Some people, uh, there's about 26 of them. Uh, some people are better at others than the individual skills. Um, but one of them is knowing how to feel good about doing something really, really small. That's a mindset skill. Uh, one of them is knowing when to push yourself and when not to. I think this is incredibly empowering, uh, BJ, because I don't think we've looked at behavior change or habit formation as a skill before. I think people feel they've either got that ability yeah. or they don't. Yeah. And actually, on many levels, it is arguably the most important skill to learn because our behaviors impact, yes, our health, but our professional life, mm -hmm. our personal life, our well-being, our relationships. It all comes on the back of human behavior yeah. ultimately everything yeah. is a downstream yeah. consequence of our behaviors and so if it is a trainable skill why are we not being taught how to do it <laughs> well i don't know the answer to that but uh in my work uh in tiny habits and other things coming out i'm mapping out those skills and helping people learn the, understand what the skills are and then learning to make them part of their life. And you're so right. You know, why, why isn't this taught to every 10 year old? Yeah. You know, here are the, here are the skills of change and we're going to teach you, we're going to work on these three this quarter and next quarter, we're going to work on these three and, and you're going to learn just like you learn math or writing or language. We're going to learn the skills of change. I would love to see that. Yeah. Well, I think your pioneering work means that actually this is likely to happen because I think what was striking for me when studying your research, but also at day one of bootcamp yesterday, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to day two today, um, a lot of it is, is common sense. It, it's not common sense it, in the sense that, you know, I, who said that phrase? The thing about common sense is not that common. <laughs> um, it's not necessarily common sense, but it's, it makes sense when you hear it. You think, yeah, yeah I get that. But nobody's really mapped it in the way that yeah. you have. So what I think you're doing for me is providing a structure and a framework to start looking at this and then it can be taught, then it can be yeah. scaled. Thank you. Um, and I also think you are incredibly modest about the, the impacts of your work because yes, we mentioned Instagram at the start. I know people from all kinds of tech giants have trained with you and used these skills mm -hmm. uh, for, the, you know, for their own products. You know, I know James Clear came on, did uh, Tiny Habits Tiny with you. And years ago. Yeah. yeah, years ago when he's written uh, a book, Atomic Habits on, you know, again, on how you create these habits. And so I think you know, to give you your due, I think you are leading this field. Thank you. And I think, um, you know, I think you've inspired a lot of people to actually go on and do some great things in the world. But I think that would be a lovely thing in the future if these skills did get taught to yeah, children. Yeah. I mean, I'm certainly going to be thinking on my flight home, how can I, how can I teach my nine-year-old boy and my six-year-old girl some of these themes, um, you know, that will help them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and not just kids, but doctors too, you know, yeah. what if, what if physicians were trained in the skills of change and so they could, now what, what happens just like learning the piano or guitar or whatever, if you have a good coach or guide, that person can take on some of the skills for you. Like when you're learning to play the piano, choosing the right songs to practice is a skill. And at the beginning, a teacher does that for you. Same thing with habits. You know, picking the right habits for you is a skill. And at the beginning, you may want a doctor or a coach to help you connect with the right habits. Over time, you'll want to learn how to pick your own, like what's the right habit for me. Another skill is how to troubleshoot a behavior that's not happening. So if you intended to um, 
let's say, text your mom every morning and it's not happening. There's a systematic way to troubleshoot that, and that's a skill. And you first, well, what you don't do is beat yourself up and say, oh, I lack my devotion motivation or I'm flaky, you start with looking at what I call a prompt. Did you have anything to remind you to text your mom? And if not, then set up some prompt that reminds you. If you are being reminded to do it and you still aren't doing it, then you still don't go to motivation. You look at ability. It's like, oh, is this too hard? And you make it easier to do. And then if you're being prompted and it's super easy at that point, then you know it's a motivation problem. And the best thing to do there for a habit you're creating for yourself is, oh, I really don't want this habit. Okay, pick something else. Yeah. yeah, so you just, you match yourself with something else. Now, why somebody wouldn't want to text their mom, I don't know. Maybe that wasn't the best example. <laughs> but the, the, the point is there is a systematic way to troubleshoot, and that is a skill. And it's pretty easy to learn that skill. Is is this skill something you teach in your book, Tiny Habits? Yes, yes. It's in Tiny Habits. Yes. Yeah. So people who feel inspired by this and go, right, I want to learn that skill. Yeah. They can buy the book yeah. and they can actually learn how to yeah. do this, not only for their health, but probably for all kinds of different things yeah. in their life, I'm guessing. But it in, And it includes like your children, uh, people at work and so on. Let's say you want uh, an, one of your colleagues at work to do a behavior, whether it's a habit or a one-time behavior, and they're not doing it. Often people will just get upset which is a motivational strategy. That's the wrong place to start. You first go, wow, did that person have a prompt? If not, make sure there was something that prompted them or reminded them. If they still don't do it, it's like, oh, maybe it's too hard to do. So yeah, you apply it to yourself, but once you know the skills of change, you can help other people more effectively. Now you've been just brilliant and I think intuitively gifted at helping people change. Uh, and now you're seeing there's a system behind it and, and that's a delight for me to see you connect what you've learned through your practice and you just being gifted in that way to say, wow, there's, this is why this works. This is why this works. Here's what the structure and system looks like. And you, like a, a gifted singer or a gifted chef, have been able to be successful even without, like, here's the system and, you know, go from the system. Uh, my work is really about putting it out there and saying, this is the system and this is how we apply it in positive ways. And this is how we uh, help people be happier and healthier. So um, for me, it's a delight to create the models. And I do think a lot of the models and methods are like riddles. Once you see the answer, it's obvious, yeah. but until then it's a, it's, it's a puzzle. Hey, it's a puzzle. We both talk about simplicity, don't we? And in terms of how important that is yeah. in, in anything. And, I felt, and I was chatting to some of my colleagues yesterday after the course finished and saying there's a, such a deceptive simplicity mm. in how you teach, but there is so much complexity behind it, but ultimately the way you deliver it is simple. And I think simplicity is absolutely critical to get ideas across. Yeah. It is something I, you know, I know you, you work on it, something um, certainly as a with patients, but also when writing these books, I've been really... I've sort of been racking my head as think, how do you make this simpler? How do you mm -hmm, make this simpler? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think when you really know something, you can make it that simple. I don't yeah. think it, it, you know, it, as I call it, deceptive simplicity. Well, the, the people I admire, so, you know, influences, uh, Mozart, Calder, Picasso, Charles Schultz, all of those people took stuff and made really simple melodies or really simple line art, or in the case of Charles Schultz, cartoons that are deceptively simple. They're very sophisticated psychologically. So I look at uh, people who have, and I actually have a word for it. I call it the feather principle. It's the simplest thing with the biggest impact. And I admire that in music and art. And in my own work, I'm constantly pushing for that. What's the simplest thing that will have the biggest impact? And when I create a model, if the model's complicated, it's like, it's not done yet. It's not done yet. It's a work in progress until there's an elegance that comes out of the model. And once, bam, I hit where it's elegant, meaning both simple and powerful, then it's done. If it's complicated, it means it's a work in progress and I haven't uh, solved the riddle yet. And yeah. I see that over and over in the work that I do. Yeah. It's, it reminds me a bit of, um, but I talk about this four pillar approach a lot, these four core areas of our health that I think have the most impacts on how we feel, but also we've got a high degree of control over food, movement, sleep, mm. and realization. Mm. It was the subject of my, of my very first awesome. book. And um, 
after it came out, a lot of people said, oh, you missed this fifth pillar or the sixth pillar. <laughs> and what's really interesting is that if you'd seen the kind of notes I'd made when creating yeah. the book is they were all there. Yeah. And it was just, a, it was trying to marry up effectiveness with simplicity. Yeah. And so a lot of people said, oh, you missed the pillar on connection. I'm thinking, well, actually, no, I absorbed that into the relaxation pillar uh, with a few of the interventions, but I purposely kept it at four because I felt once I go to five, six, seven, it starts to become too complex to actually yeah. be practical in real life. And it's, there is something about simplicity, I think, but it's the same when creating a new habit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me give, uh, it was probably about 2001. I'm at Stanford. I'm at my research lab. And this guy walks up to me. I didn't know very well. I knew who he was because he's kind of famous, Patrick Soupies. He walks up to me and it's, he said, it's not about having the biggest, most complicated ideas. It's about making them actionable. Just out of the blue, Rangan, he walks up to me and says, it's about making your stuff actionable. And it's like, okay, first of all, I don't even think he knows my work and why is he telling me this, but it stuck with me. At the same time, you know, my work, I was looking at what's happening with technology and what would take off. And I clearly saw the pattern in the late 90s that the only things that really took off were drop dead simple. So I was this huge yeah. fan of simplicity, even before I had my behavior model. And then Patrick Soupies comes up and tells me this. And I was like, okay, is my work actionable? Oh, not so much. And that really, so I got obsessed with simplicity. I mean, it was natural anyway. I mean, I'm kind of that kind of guy. Um, and then that understanding of simplicity then opened the door to creating the behavior model. So I knew that it, the factor, I now call it ability, but it's simplicity or ease or capacity. That's one of three factors that comprise a behavior. And so with that as a stake in the ground, then I could say, well, there has to be motivation. Bam, that's the next factor. And then third, it was like prompt. There has to be something that says do this now. And there's only three things. So every behavior is comprised of those three things. And if you want to start a behavior or habit, you have to make sure all three things are present. Some motivation, you have to be able to do it and there has to be a prompt. If you want to stop a behavior, you remove motivation or you make it harder to do. You remove ability or you take away the prompt. It's the same uh, set of it's the same components for any behavior, uh, whether you're starting it or stopping it, whether it's a habit, whether it's a one time. So once you see it that way, that's kind of the, wow, is yeah. it really that simple? And the answer is, yeah, it is. Yeah. It always comes back to those three things. Yeah, incredible. And you're right. You can literally apply that to every behavior as I've been seeing yesterday and, and through, through your teachings yesterday, I've been thinking, yeah, you can pretty much apply this to everything. It really does marry up. Um, look, BJ, I'm, I'm sort of conscious of your time and there is so much more I want to talk about, but I, I know boot camp is starting relatively soon. So Yay. let's just quickly <laughs> um, knock off a few things if we can. Um, research out there, some suggest it takes 21 days to create a new habit. Some says 66 days. No, I'm not convinced. No. What is your view? No, that's that's they're looking at old paradigms of change. They're looking at the idea that repetition, it's not repetition, it's emotions. There are some things, and I'm going to push on this harder to help make it clear. There are some things that are instant habits. Let's say I buy a new car and I really like that car. How long does it take to drive that new car as my habit rather than the old car? No time, right? Immediately. How long does it take um, a teenager to carry her mobile phone around? You, you give your teenage daughter a mobile phone. How long does that <laughs> habit take? No, it doesn't. So it's not uh, it's not repetition. It's the emotional experience that people have as they do the behavior. And so, yeah, that whole thing about 21 days, 66 days, that's just, um, it's people that haven't looked at it from the right perspective that are pushing that forward. Another question, your pinned tweet at the moment, oh. if I just pull it up, <laughs> oh, no. and, uh, <laughs> which I really, really like. Let's see if I can get it up because uh, I can't remember it at the top of my head. Um, I really liked this. And, um, oh, where's it gone now? Here we go. A company asked for my 2020 prediction. Here it is. Please don't be offended. A movement to be post-digital will emerge in 2020. We will start to realize that being chained to your mobile phone is a low-status behavior similar to smoking. Yeah. You have proven your track record in the past at predicting mm. what is going to happen in technology. Why did you make that tweet? I'm really hoping, right? So, because I agree, yeah, actually. So. Yeah, I'm really hoping. So, post digital probably isn't the right word, but a backlash 
against always having your mobile phone out, always taking a selfie, being at dinner, pulling out your phone, that more and more I'm predicting will become something that people are like, no, that's bad etiquette. That's not what you do. And even, you know, you know, I spend half my time in Maui and I go to the beach a lot and it just drives me crazy when people are one of the most beautiful places on earth and there they are on their, I don't know what they're doing on their mobile phone. And it's like, look out, you see whales, you see turtles. And so the idea that, um, doing this, people will more and more understand that this is not like being cool to do this. This is a low status behavior. And I hope with that new framing and understanding that people will then not be so compelled to do it. And then when they do do it, they will kind of go like, oh, I need to step out and check my phone, just like people will do that around smoking. Yeah. And, and so I do think that will happen. I think we can ac help accelerate that. Um, no, I love that. Yeah, I love that. I agree okay. with it. And I think that is coming. Uh, final question then is we are in your house behind us. And for those of you watching it on YouTube, I know most people listen to it. There's a, there's ukuleles, there's guitars, there's piano. There's this, uh, this gorgeous, what's that device called again? It's called a vast drum. Vast drum. I mean, just absolutely. Yeah, absolutely incredible. <laughs> um, we probably don't have time to really unpack this, but you were saying at the start that learning a musical instrument is super important. Yeah. Why is that? Well, for me, you know, life can be really hard. It's hard for everybody. Even if you see somebody and think they have their act together, they still have hard things. And so for me, what totally helps me is being in nature and playing musical instruments. I know that. Um, I was sort of forced to play piano growing up because my mom's super musical and I did it to be a dutiful son. But I think that training was really helpful for me in lots of ways, because you're a musician, yeah. you know this, that you're not going to be perfect. You have a new song. You're not going to be, you're going to make tons of mistakes. And that's helpful in behavior change. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes and that's okay. And it's part of the process. You're going to get better if you practice in the right way and so on. So I think the skills and the insights that you get from learning to play an instrument or learning to do anything you can then apply those same skills or ways of thinking toward behavior change. Once you recognize that behavior change is a skill. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, BJ, I, I really want to thank you again for the incredible work you have done. You are thank you. changing the lives of many, many people around the globe. Many people will have been influenced by your work and frankly will not be aware that they've been influenced by <laughs> your work. I think people should go out and buy your book, Tiny Habits. I think it's an incredible insight into how you create a new behavior. And it's going to help a lot of people. This podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. Uh, it's, again, deceptively simple in the yeah. sense that when you feel better in yourself, you get more out of life. I always like to leave my listeners with some top actionable tips, simple things that they can think about applying into their own life immediately. You have a wealth of experience, a wealth yeah. of knowledge. Do you have a few simple tips that you can share? You probably already mentioned them, yeah. but just to inspire them to take action. Yeah, let me give three. Uh, and top of mind, uh, one, start every day that as soon as your feet hit the floor in the morning, as soon as you're standing up, say, it's going to be a great day. And I know that sounds hokey, like a California woo-woo hippie affirmation <laughs> thing, but try it. And what that habit does is it starts your day in the best possible way. In my book, there's only one habit. I tell people how to create any habit they want, but there's only one habit I prescribe. It's that one. I call it the Maui habit. And you, know, you say, it's going to be a great day. And if you don't believe it's going to be a great day, still, I mean, there's days where I'm like, oh, this is going to be so hard. I say, it's going to be a great day uh, somehow. But I say it. One, do that. Number two, um, when you're frustrated with somebody, whether it's somebody that's driving or somebody to check it online or your spouse or your child, let that be your prompt to think, everybody's doing the best they can nobody tries to screw up. And I find that in my life, that is so helpful to have empathy and patience with people. It's like, nobody tries to screw up. They're doing the best they can given what's going on with them. So I find that helpful. Um, really tactical and very specific. Uh, one habit, it's similar to the tea kettle one you recommended, is as soon as you turn on the shower, have that be your reminder to think of one positive thing about your body. 
So I shower at night. Most people maybe, where the night or morning doesn't matter, but as soon as you turn it on, you got to wait for a few seconds for it to get warm, unless you're doing cold showers. <laughs> I don't love cold showers. While you're waiting, use that, I call it a meanwhile habit. Use that time to think of one positive thing about your body, whether it's, oh, I have a cut, it healed, or my skin is flexible, or I really like, you know, whatever it is, you know, my fingernails. Well, think, find one new thing every time it's easy to do. And what I think the bigger effect is, and I haven't studied this directly, but I would wager the bigger effect then is you then start appreciating this marvelous thing that is your body. And you start appreciating in new ways. And every day you're looking at it from a different angle. So those would be three things. I love them, BJ. They're brilliant tips. If that conversation resonated with you, I think you are really going to get a lot out of the very first one I had with the incredible Dr. Gabo Mate. It's right there. So give it a click and let me know what you think. Once you're asking not by the addiction, but by the pain, now you have to forget that it's a choice because nobody chooses to be in pain. And you also have to forget the medical idea that it's an inherited brain disease.